So all our participants po, we will be starting in two minutes. participants and welcome again to the 27th Summer Institute in the Natural Sciences and Mathematics. Before we start with the lecture per se, here are a few reminders for this webinar. First, the entire proceedings of this webinar will be recorded for documentation purposes. All attendees of the webinar, except for the moderators and speakers, should keep their cameras switched off and their microphones on mute during the webinar and the subsequent open forum or Q&A. In case that the webinar is interrupted due to a technical problem, all are asked to wait for 10 minutes to give the meeting hosts time to resolve the problem or in case that the problem cannot be fixed to announce that the webinar has been suspended and will be rescheduled. During the open forum, all those wanting to ask questions should send their queries via the Q&A function of the Zoom webinar or in the comment section of the YouTube streaming. The moderator will determine if follow-up questions can still be accommodated or not. After the web webinar, participants are enjoined to accomplish an evaluation form and the link for the said form will be posted on the chat feature of the Zoom meeting and the comment section of the YouTube streaming. Before we proceed to the next, the College of Science Cynicism Committee wishes to thank the UPB System and Network Office for their enormous support to this event. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the lectures. So, good morning po sa ating lahat. Uh, magandang umaga po and welcome to uh, the last day of the 27th Summer Institute in the Natural Sciences and Mathematics or Sinism in short. And this year's theme is uh, Upgrading Senior High School Science and Mathematics Education, Content and Competency Part 2. Okay, so sana nakapag-almosal na po kayong lahat or kung hindi pa po, pwede naman po kayong kumuha ng makakain, may inom, uh, habang nakikinig po sa lectures. So in any case po, uh, I hope everyone is as excited to listen as you were in the past lectures. So we've learned a lot from the previous two days and I hope uh, everyone still has the energy to listen to the last set of lectures for today. 
Okay, so uh, if you didn't know po, uh, CINISM is an annual extension service of the College of Science here at the University of the Philippines, Baguio, with the aim of reinforcing pedagogy and research in science and mathematics through innovative uh, approaches. So specifically for the biology cluster, this year we want to focus on rekindling biodiversity uh, rekindling appreciation of biodiversity from classroom to community. So with that in mind, so far we had lectures about different forms or different groups of organisms, and we have learned about various activities that we can uh, we can share to our students. So specifically, uh, during the first day, Paul, we learned from Dr. Aris Reginaldo and Ma'am Kimberly Paglingayan about rodents and parasites. Uh, we also learned about floristic biodiversity from uh, Prof. Lizal Magtoto, and then during the second day, uh, we were greeted with a very engaging lecture from Prof. P.G. Bagangao on insect biodiversity. And then apart from that, uh, we also had uh, lectures about communicating biodiversity with the local people by Dr. Zinaida Bawangan, as well as conservation and restoration efforts on coral diversity from Dr. Romeo Dizan. And they also shared with us how we can incorporate these in our own teaching and how we can plan future classroom activities that involve our communities. Okay, so, uh, and now we are on the third and last day of this event, and we will continue to explore more forms of organisms. Specifically, we will learn about microbes and fungi. So today's event will only be a half day, but I am sure that it will be just as interesting, as informative, and as substantial as the previous days. Okay, so but before we start with the program, let me just introduce myself. Um, my name is Kautar Sharif, and like many of us here, I am also an educator. So I am uh, an instructor here at the University of the Philippines, Baguio, and I will be your MC and moderator for the first part of today's event. So I would also like to recognize uh, the efforts of the Systems uh, and Networks Office, as well as the College of Science and Com Committee for organizing and arranging this event. And of course, uh, let's not forget all the participants support. So all of your support for the entirety of this event. So thank you very much to everyone. And now, uh, natapos, uh, sana nakuha niyo yung mga netiquette rules, so we won't be playing them anymore. So now, let's proceed to uh, the introduction of our first speaker. Okay, so our first speaker for today is a young and accomplished uh, educator and researcher. So he is Dr. Jason Antonio, and he is currently uh, an assistant professor in biology at De La Salle University, Manila and also currently a senior lecturer in microbiology here at UP Baguio. So aside from earning his undergraduate degree in biology for teachers at Philippine Normal University and the master's degree in biology at De La Salle University, Manila, he also very recently completed a combined master's and PhD, PhD degree in medical science at the Yonsei University in South Korea. So he also won the Best Young Scientist Award at the Korean Society of Toxicogenomics and Toxicoproteomics last November. So Dr. Antonio has a wide range of research interests, including uh, medical research, biotech, molecular biology, and microbiology. And today he will be joining us to share his experience and knowledge on the health-related applications of microbial met metabolites. Okay, so and with that, let us all give a round, a virtual round of applause to uh, Dr. Jason Antonio. So he, he is here with us right now, but he has prepared for us a recorded, le recorded video of his lecture. So uh, i-play po natin yun. Okay. A warm greetings and a lovely morning, everyone. I'm Jason Antonio, and I'm very thankful uh, for giving me opportunity to present in front of educators, students, and researchers. Um, I am a part-time uh, senior lecturer at University of the Philippines, Baguio, and El Salle University, Manila. And today, I'd like to share my presentation, uh, Health-Related Applications of Microbial Metabolites, and uh, I'm hoping you'll find it intriguing, and I'm hoping that this presentation will raise your awareness of relevance of microorganisms in our health. 
So, this is the outline of my presentation. So, for part one, we are going to define human. And, of course, uh, we have microbiota and human health. Uh, the interaction of human cells and microorganisms, as well as how um, microbial metabolites affects human health. For part two, we have uh, from isolation and metabolite production. So we are going to discuss where to isolate, uh, which colony should uh, we study, um, the importance of culture media for metabolite production, as well as um, bioactivity screening and um, microbial um, metabolites. So before that, uh, let's dissect the uh, title of the study or the presentation. So it's all about health-related applications. So we are dealing about health. And health is actually is what we call homeostasis in biology. And in this model, we have two important factors. Uh, we have the salutogens and pathogens. When we say salutogens, these are uh, health-promoting factors, or we sometimes call the good factors. And for pathogens, these are what we call the disease-promoting factors. And during homeostasis, uh, the good and a bad factor should be balanced or maintained. And in this condition, we call it health, or in this condition, we call it the body are in degree of free uh, from illness or what we call the state of being well. Uh, as of now, health is becoming a very important thing for us, especially uh, this uh, pandemic. Okay. For another part of the um, another part of this uh, lecture or uh, talk is about microbial metabolites. So what do we mean by microbial metabolites? So microbial metabolites, um, before that, let's define what is microbes. And of course, as a science teacher or a student, um, you know that um, you know that microbes are um, divided into two. Uh, we can classify them whether they are cellular or acellular. Uh, under cellular, of course, these are made up of cells. It means they are living things. They are following chemoton model. They have membrane, they have metabolism, and of course, they have genetic material. And uh, of course, we have here bacteria, archaeans, proteins, and fungi. And for a cellular, of course, these are the viruses, viroids, satellites, and prions. For this presentation, we are dealing with bacteria like uh, bacteria, and we are dealing with bacterial metabolites. So for bacterial metabolites, um, let's define first what is metabolites. So metabolites are products and intermediates of cellular metabolism. And metabolites can have, of course, multitude uh, of function. It can be for energy conversion, for cellular signaling, it could affect uh, transcription uh, and translation of genes or have epigenetic influence and it could act as a cofactor okay and for bacteria or any um, microorganism we can divide met metabolites into uh, two we have the primary and secondary metabolites so primary metabolites uh, of course you have the essential metabolites and of course we have the end product uh, of course, example, we have amino acid, nucleoside, vitamins, and enzyme. And example of end product or the byproduct, we have alcohol and organic acids. And for primary essential metabolites, bacteria produce such metabolites in uh, adequate amounts. And these are important to sustain, of course, bacterial growth. And uh, these metabolites also is important for regulatory mechanism for them to, to grow. And bacteria can control, of course, the production and overproduction of uh, essential uh, metabolites. So when do bacteria produce primary metabolites and secondary metabolites? So let's examine the uh, microbial growth curve. Okay, so the microbial growth um, is actually divided into four parts. So we have the lag, logarithmic, stationary, and dead. So the lag phase is the preparation for uh, bacterial replication or bacterial growth or bacterial uh, multiplication, okay? So um, in this stage, of course, we have the uh, primary metabolite. And as the cell 
multiplies or the bacteria multiplies, of course, the amount of primary metabolite is also increased because the number of cells in are increased. And of course, you have the stationary phase where the number of dead cells and the number of uh, living cells are actually equal. At this time, the bacteria already reaches the carrying capacity. Um, so at this point also, the bacteria is starting to produce uh, the secondary metabolites. And these secondary metabolites could be um, vitamins, toxins, etc. Okay, and of course we have the TET phase if the nutrients are not available anymore, if the waste products are actually increased and the environment is not conducive enough for bacterial replication, of course, the population is starting to decline. So uh, in this discussion, we are going to um, deal with the primary and secondary uh, metabolites of bacteria and their effects, of course, in our health. So let's go a little bit deeper, okay? So now we um, talk about uh, our perspective of human cell. So here we have two figures. Uh, we have A and B. So most of the time, your biology professor um, will say that humans are homo sapiens, okay? So when you say homo sapiens, that is a species, okay? So it has a genus and specific habitat. But technically, humans are made up of a community of microbes. Okay, So we are a walking community. And uh, of course, human, we have the brain, we have this immune system, and we have this genome. And what is fascinating about this is that um, our resident microbes okay, orchestrate the adaptive immunity as well as it influences our brain and of course it contribute more gene function than our gene our genome our own genome so the realization is that humans are not individual we are not discrete entities but rather uh, we are outcomes of uh, this ever-changing interaction with microbes and this interaction give us um, a lot of consequences beyond biological disciplines okay so to further discuss that, let's examine humans, uh, human in proportion of cells. So around 30 trillions of cells, uh, of course, those are human cells. And most of cells in our body, okay, if we count all the microbes in our body, it's like approximately 100 trillion of cells. It means there are more microbial cells than human cells. And this is giving us a question whether we are human or we are microbes, okay? So another fascinating thing, and after comparing the number of cells, we can compare the number of genes, okay? So if we count human genes, it's around like approximately 23,000 uh, human genes. And since we have more microbes in our body, than our cells and therefore there are more microbial genes in our body and if we are actually uh, identifying species as uh, in terms of genetic code we should think again because since there are more microbial genes than human genes in our body okay so here we have around 2 million okay Almost 99% are made up of uh, microbial genes. So these microbes are actually found on our skin, uh, urogenital tract, the intestine, or the gastrointestinal tract, um, the mouth, pharynx, respiratory system, blood. So it can found uh, throughout our body. And if you are dealing with bacteria, of course, uh, bacteria or microbes, uh, there can be good bacteria and there can be bad bacteria or we, there can be salutogens or there can be pathogens. So in this picture, again, there should be a balance between good and bad bacteria to achieve health or what we call homeostasis. So the good bacteria or beneficial bacteria, they secreted metabolites that can affect our cells. And of course, this metabolite maintains uh, the health of our cells. Whereas 
If there are some factors that increases the opportunistic bacteria or pathogens in our body, these opportunistic bacteria will also produce metabolites. And these metabolites can, of course, affect the function of our cells, leading to what we call um, unhealthy, okay? And in terms of bacteria level, when there is more opportunistic and the normal level of good and bad bacteria are compromised, that condition is what we call dysbiosis. So take note, dysbiosis occurs when the, the bacteria or the normal flora uh, in our body is actually changed. So therefore, for example, if our oral microbiota or oral bacteria goes to other parts of our body such as the blood or kidney or urogenic tract or our skin, um, it can cause disruption of the our normal microbiome, okay? So the concept is that our skin has a normal residence of bacteria, okay? And these bacteria are necessary in promoting the health of our skin, as well as with our mouth, as well as with our pharynx and respiratory system. So if bacteria found in our pharynx or mouth goes inside our skin, it can lead to what we call dysbiosis or disruption of the normal flora. So the good example is uh, Neisseria meningitis. Okay. So let's examine Neisseria meningitis. Uh, so this is the gram stain of Neisseria meningitis. So it's a cocci and a gram-negative diplococci. Uh, most of the teacher or students will believe that Neisseria meningitis, uh, of course, will cause uh, meningitis or inflammation of the brain meninges. But technically, these Neisseria meningitis are part of our normal microbiota. So what do we mean by that? So Neisseria meningitis, it actually colonizes our nasopharynx okay so it means we have Neisseria meningitis in our nasopharynx and it's normal and we don't have meningitis okay what happened is when the Neisseria meningitis invaded or goes to our bloodstream and travels through our uh, brain that's the time we get Neisseria uh, that, that's the time we get meningitis So once again, uh, Neisseria meningitis, uh, these bacteria are found in our, uh, of course, nose and throat, and they cannot um, cause disease or without causing disease. And most uh, people exposed to Neisseria meningitis, uh, they do not become ill, okay? Only a few people develop illnesses, uh, which might be associated with some factors like genetic, immune, or societal, or uh, physical factors. Another normal uh, part of our normal microbiota, also in um, nose, um, nasal pharynx, of course, we have uh, Staphylococcus aureus. So in this figure, we sh uh, of course, we have the anterior nasal cavity and posterior nasal cavity. And we can find, of course, Staphylococcus aureus there. Um, the thing is, um, again, Staphylococcus aureus, that is common part of our normal microbiota, especially uh, our nasal cavity. So what happened is that uh, we are carrying some S aureus that are drug resistant, but we do not display symptoms of uh, Staphylococcus aureus um, infection. Uh, we can only get active infection of MRSA again once the bacteria enter the other parts of our body. So example, if the bacteria has entered our body through a wound or we have skin laceration, uh, it goes to the blood, etc. That's the time we display the symptoms. And for active infection, usually the infection can be community acquired or hospital acquired. So another bacteria, group of bacteria uh, with like 
good uh, and bad side, of course, we have the E. coli. So we have good E. coli and bad E. coli. Actually, most of the E. coli are good and only a few um, um, strains of E. coli are considered uh, bad. And E. coli are actually found uh, inside also of our uh, gastrointestinal tract or we have this intestinal E. coli. Uh, most of our intestinal bacteria or part of the normal flora or normal microbiota or those uh, bacteria that are living symbiotically and commensally with us are beneficial. So take note, these bacteria in our gut, uh, they are responsible for production of some vitamins as well as um, maintaining the amount of uh, minerals uh, in in our body. An example, of course, we have E. coli. As I told you, E. coli produces uh, vitamin K and they also produces vitamin B12. When we um, um, take a lot of antibiotics, some of these E. coli are, uh, of course, they died, okay? And what happened to them is when there is no enough vitamin K, of course, it can uh, interfere the normal blood clotting process. So that's another downside or side effect of taking too much uh, antibiotic. It kills the beneficial bacteria uh, found in our gut. Okay, so some of the E. coli that are considered pathogenic here we have the E. coli uh, 011, 0157, and 026. These are E, H, E, C, or what we call enterohemorrhagic E. coli. Um, so here we have the pathogenic enteric E. coli and extra intestinal E. coli. When we say pathogenic enteric E. coli, this E. coli affects our gastrointestinal tract. Okay. And of course, they can cause diarrhea um, and intestinal inflammation. For extra intestinal, so it's not found in the intestine, rather they promote uh, inflammation of other parts of the body. So for example, we have UTI. So we have uropathogenic E. coli, and we also have E. coli or neonat neonatal meningitis E. coli. Um, things okay and take note the parts of the bacteria are actually important for them to elicit uh, virulence okay so uh, example of those of course we have the pimpre we have the pili uh, of course some of them produces uh, toxins and etc okay so this virulence factor makes this e coli uh, pathogenic so if we have pathogens or we have commensals that goes to other part of our body and becomes pathogens, so we also have bacteria that maintains or control the amount of pathogenic bacteria in our body. So let's consider Clostridium difficile as an example. And Clostridium difficile is usually associated with diarrhea. Um, so what happens is uh, sometimes we can ingest the spore of Clostridium difficile. And uh, take note, these bacteria, they have different um, stages, okay? So here we have vegetative cell, we have spores, and of course we have the germination. So what happens? Spores are resistant, okay? Therefore, even though these spores travel through our stomach, they remain intact, they resist the uh, environment or the harsh condition or the harsh environment, the acidic environment of the stomach. So as the spores travels to uh, the small intestine, uh, the, it gets contact with the bile acid. And the bile acid or the primary bile acid found in our intestine causes the germination of these spores. It's like seed. Once contact with water, it becomes, of course, it undergoes um, germination process, okay? So in case of uh, Clostridium difficile uh, spores, once it ha have contact with uh, bile acid, it's starting to germinate and, of course, become uh, vegetative cells, okay? So as it travels to the, um, here, as it travels to the large intestine, of course, it becomes uh, uh, vegetative cells, okay? So the vegetative cells, therefore, um, will create uh, some spores, okay? 
So and then the spores, of course, it uh goes out um through of course elimination um um excretion of course uh through of course poop okay pooping okay so of course the feces it contains now the uh, spores of Clostridium difficile. So what happened is the vegetative cells uh, in the large intestine it started to secrete toxins and that's the dangerous thing about uh clostridium difficile so mostly in the class we are um studying the parts of bacteria and we let our student to um of course uh memorize the parts of the bacteria like the flagellum the capsule the cell wall and so on but it's better for our student or us to remember or appreciate the parts by taking consider the the effect of these um bacterial parts uh on our health okay so for example we have clostridium difficile the important thing is that the clostridium difficile have different bacterial parts we have the cell wall we have the s layer we have the flagella and the cell membrane okay and of course this bacteria also produces proteins such as the cda and tcdb okay so while studying okay we should mention the importance of the parts the flagella is not only for swimming Okay, or movement or motility. The cell wall is not only to resist osmotic pressure, but rather these parts of bacteria are important for their virulence factor. So for example, the flagella, the cell wall, and uh, S layer, they act uh, here, for example, the flagella and the S layer acts on the receptors of the whole cell. Okay, And this, uh, once it acts on the receptor of the whole cell, it triggers cellular reaction or signaling inside the cell and this signaling activates inflammatory signaling okay so once there is inflammation of course that is considered pathological for uh, the host or dangerous for the host another thing for example we have protein here or toxin tcda and tcdb it in um activates the inflammasome or it activates some receptor in the cells that also activates inflammation uh in the host so so this is a better picture. So for example, we have toxin A and toxin B produced by, of course, Clostridium difficile. And this is what, uh, this is our colonic epithelium or the cells of the colon. So once this toxin uh, gets contact with the cells of the colon, the cells of the colon starting to die. And of course, uh, once they die, um, it also uh, activates inflammatory signaling. So the numbers of the immunocytes okay increases to the area causing edema causing a lot of inflammation and so on so this is what happened in the colon once there's invasion or colonization of clostridium difficile um for the colonoscopy so this is a healthy colon and this is a colon invaded by clostridium difficile and uh, so this is visually like after colonoscopy and under the microscope if we are going to study the tissues we can examine normal affected by a clostridium difficile so why am i discussing clostridium difficile so take note when there is an increase in pathogenic or bad bacteria uh, the thing is we can inhibit the um, uh, bad health okay we can inhibit the bad bacteria we can promote health by um, supplementation of good bacteria okay so this is a very lovely picture and of course we have here poop okay so what's with the poop and why it's so precious? So take note, uh, our poop or the healthy poop or poop of a healthy person contains important bacteria. They contain balanced bacteria, like balanced good bacteria and bad bacteria. And we can process the poop 
actually, we can process this tool and supply it to a person suffering with uh, infection like Clostridium difficile infection. And of course, in this process, it's like we are shaking the poop, like making a puree. And after the puree, we can um, transplant this poop. Um, so we call it fecal microbiota transplantation or fecal microbial transplant to those people with compromised uh, microbiota. Okay. So for example, we have a healthy donor. And from the healthy donor, we can take uh, stool samples. And of course, we need to conduct a laboratory testing uh, to check, of course, the parasite and viruses. We need to prepare the fecal sample. Uh, and of course, we have this, the FMT or the uh, fecal gut microbiota transplantation. So this FMT or this fecal sample from healthy donor uh, can be transplanted to a patient suffering through a uh, Clostridium difficile in infection. We can transfer it by a colonoscopy here, okay, from the anus to the colon, or through a uh, gastroscopy, okay, or through oral capsule, okay. The fascinating thing about uh, fecal microbiota transfer is it can um, deter or it can inhibit, of course, the inflammation of uh, brought by Clostridium difficile. So here is a paper showing uh, the effect of uh, FMT. So here we have the control, like without Clostridium difficile infection. And after Clostridium difficile, as you can see, we have here edema, okay? And uh, of course, we have infiltration of uh, immune cells. And what happened is the edema, okay, or the swell swelling actually decreases after the FMT. So what's with FMT? Why it's quite famous? So another uh, study for FMT is that they studied it with twins, okay? So one of the twin, um, is obese and the other one is lean. So one is healthy, the other one is obese, okay? The healthy person is, again, a person is a community of microbiome. It means a healthy person have different microbial composition, okay, compared with a uh, obese person. And what they found out, here they use as mouse. These are mouse that do not have any bacteria or microbiota. So let's say these are clean uh mice okay so what happened is they transplanted uh the uh, feces okay from obese okay person through the mice okay and and then they transplanted the feces from healthy person to the mice okay and what happened of course after the transplantation after they feed low fat diet and high fiber diet in the mice they found out that the mice who received a uh, fecal transplant from obese individual become obese also, okay? While for mice that gets fecal um, transplant from lean uh, individual, it stay uh, lean. It means uh, through feces, okay, our um, disease can be transferred through feces, okay? So it means the microbiome influences our metabolism, our health, and the composition of our microbiome determines the status of our health, okay? So another fascinating thing about the microbiome is that when we compared um, uh, this same uh, spectrum disorder, uh, person with autism spectrum disorder, and typical developing uh, or person, um, their microbiota is actually different from each other. And as you can see here, we have high, the TD or what we say the normal person have high level of uh, bacteroides. And here we don't have, there is less level of bacteroides, okay? Um, and they found out that uh, supplementation or fecal transplantation of uh, again feces or 
the microbiota from person with autism spectrum disorder to germ-free mice, okay, like very clean mice without any microorganism, their microorganism only comes from the donor, which is a person with autism spectrum disorder. They found out that these mice exhibit like humanized, uh, these mice exhibit um, autism-like um, syndrome, okay, or disorder. So we have the, these mice uh, showed impaired social communication interaction. It's very fascinating. And those um, uh, mice that receive um, feces, okay, or microbiota from typical developing or we say in a normal person, they didn't have this uh, social impairment uh, behavior. Okay. Um, so it means that our microbiota affects our behavior. And that's very interesting. So it's not only a healthy body, but also healthy mind. So another thing, how microbiome or our microbiota affects our brain function is that this biosis or increase in pathogenic uh, bacteria or harmful bacteria in the gut causes, of course, the uh, disruption of the epithelial barrier in our gut. Uh, it, this one causes a lot of inflammation, at the same time increases the levels of this protein we call alpha cyanoclin. So this alpha cyanoclin transferred from the bloodstream down to our brain and increases the deposition of alpha cyanoclin. So what is this alpha cyanoclin? So take note, so in the gut, um, again, the disruption or dysbiosis causes the intestinal wall to be leaky, okay, and some of the metabolites Okay, as well as the bad bacteria, of course, uh, goes inside and affects the function of enteric glia or the enteric neuron. Okay, so the enteric neuron or neuron here around our colon uh, interacts with bacteria and then this neuron will produce alpha synuclein. Okay, and then this alpha synuclein um to transfer okay it migrates to the vagal nerve down to the substantia nigra and of course the brain okay so what happened okay so this uh alpha synuclein uh aggregates and once there is too much aggregation of alpha synuclein it causes of course um um dead okay or toxicity with the neurons okay so this is the, um, in this condition, uh, people with uh, Parkinson's disease suffers with accumulation of uh, alpha synuclein. okay? So the gut microbiota, they are very important, like increase in pathogenic bacteria causes disruption of intestinal cells. And of course, this bacteria goes to our bloodstream their metabolites goes to our bloodstream causing systemic inflammation tissue damage and as well as of course changes in gut brain signaling whereas healthy or beneficial bacteria they produce metabolites like um, protein and peptides branch chains amino acid acetates uh, short chain fatty acids and so on and these signaling molecules actually um beneficial to our metabolic organs such as the liver, um, heart, um, pancreas, etc. So speaking of beneficial bacteria, let's travel from the Philippines down to this wonderful country we call Bulgaria. And of course, the first evidence of uh, for probiotic or those we call beneficial bacteria so the first evidence of probiotic action uh, of Bulgarian yogurt, okay, date back in 16th century. So we have this famous king, we call French King Francois the um, first. Before he had a diarrhea, a chronic diarrhea, and this chronic diarrhea is um, cured by, of course, simple yogurt diet. So. 
take note, like the name of the country is Bulgaria. So we have this Bulgarian researcher, Stamen Grigorov, and he discovered this lactic acid bacteria found uh, in yogurt. So this lactic acid bacteria we call Bacillus bulgaricus, okay, uh, is important uh, for, of course, transforming milk into yogurt. And of course, we have this uh, Russian scientist named Ilya Machinikov, um, who studied uh, stamen uh, findings, okay. And of course, um, he kind of associated the yogurt consumption of Bulgarian peasant. And most of the Bulgarian peasant, they eat a lot of yogurt and they have this uh, long lifespan, okay. And his studies involve, of course, uh, 37 countries of the world, among uh, which M Makchinov uh, found that most people in Bulgaria have, of course, a longer lifespan, like more than 100 years. And he associated that with the amount of yogurt consumption. So it means more yogurt consumption, more Lactobacillus bulgaricus, it means a uh, longer lifespan. So like... Like Lactobacillus bulgaricus and other Lactobacilli, of course, Lactobacilli are important uh, part of our normal uh, microbiota in the gut. So this Lactobacilli actually produces a lot of metabolites, and these metabolites are found to have antimicrobial activity. They're, they uh, inhibit uh, colonies of um, pathogenic bacteria, as well as pathogenic fungi, as well as their biofilm formation, okay. They also found out that uh, some of the metabolites from lactobacilli, um, they also have anti-tumor activity. It decreases the tumor size, uh, decreases tumor cell proliferation, some cells undergo apoptosis, and it also increases survival of mouse uh, with uh, tumors, okay. And of course, uh, some of the metabolites, uh, they can modulate the uh, microbiota composition, increasing the uh, population of beneficial microbes and decreasing the population of pathogens. And another thing, it also have an immunomodulatory effects. Uh, it, uh, of course, increases anti-inflammatory cytokines and decreases the pro-inflammatory cytokines. So... Um, some bacteria, not only lactic acid bacteria, they also produces bacteriocins, which acts as an antimicrobial agent. They can also produce hydrogen peroxide and lactic acid, which can uh, inhibit the growth of pathogenic uh, bacteria. So therefore, beneficial bacteria competes with pathogenic bacteria. And uh, of course, in order to compete, they need to secrete something to fight for those um, pathogenic bacteria. On the other hand, it also benefited the host because the metabolites such as the polyamines, vitamins, uh, short-chain fatty acid, uh, GABA, tryptophan metabolites, and uh, histamine can act, of course, with host cells to promote uh, immune response or um, um, signaling, chemical signaling, and, and so on. And uh, of course, since we're talking about a bacteriocin, so these are bacteriocins. Uh, it's a poly, it's a peptide, okay? And we have different kinds of bacteriocins that, uh, of course, targeted different parts of the cell depending on the bacteriocin. So there are bacteriocins that can target or eliminate the growth of gram negative bacteria. There are some bacteriocins that can eliminate uh, the growth of gram positive bacteria. So some of the bacteriocins that inhibit gram negative bacteria, they can inhibit, of course, the DNA replication. And for gram positive bacteria, some bacteriocins inhibit, of course, the cell wall formation, the membrane. Um, of course, we have the translation process and so on. So bactericins are, uh, again, a metabolite uh, used by bacteria to inhibit the growth of other bacteria. And lactic acid bacteria, they are good source of uh, bactericins to fight uh, pathogenic bacteria. So another thing, again, the butyrate and other um, compound um, or metabolites produced by uh, beneficial bacteria, 
they can increase beta oxidation of intestinal cells which is actually health promoting and the thing is we call this relationship as a uh, symbiosis because uh, of course in a normal symbiotic situation the bacteria or the obligate anaerobe in our gut uh, interacts well with our intestinal cells uh, and they promote healthy um, metabolism of intestinal cells it means we have less inflammation on the other hand when we have a lot of pathogenic bacteria they also increases they changes the metabolic profile of the intestinal cells making it like glycolytic which uh, become like an inflammatory uh, environment um, like an environment that um, fuels inflammation rather okay so where can we isolate lactic acid bacteria so we can find a lot of lactic acid bacteria in fermented uh, products so such as fermented mustard fermented soybean fermented fish and fermented rice um, and so on so during the isolation we need media and one of the most recommended media for lactic acid isolation we have the mrs and these are the composition uh, lactic acid bacteria is fastidious bacteria so it requires rich and complex cultivation media for normal growth and they cannot grow on a simple min mineral media supplemented by just uh, only carbon source so that's why we have extra uh, components so example we have magnesium sulfate and manganese sulfate they are important for the growth of lactic acid bacteria we have buffering agent and they found out that addition of twin 80 also increases proliferation of lactic acid bacteria we also have a lot of nitrogen sources here we have the peptone beef extract and yeast extract and of course here we have uh, dextrose or the source of our uh, carbon in simple carbohydrate or simple sugar um, so another media we have m17 this is also used for lactic acid um, bacteria isolation and of course we have nitrogen source for them we have the uh, polypeptone soya peptone beef extract and uh, tryptone peptone and of course you have the presence of magnesium we have um, even meat peptone we have lactose and uh, glycerol uh, phosphate as a uh, source also of um, carbon okay um, here uh, this is actually from my colleague uh, Genesis Alkawili. In his study, uh, he isolated the Lactobacillus and Enterococcus from fermented products. And these are the colonies of Lactobacillus plantarum and Enterococcus facium. And uh, he actually uh, checked the antifungal activity of these isolates or lactic acid bacteria against um, Trico, uh, microsporum or dermatophytes um, and another thing is the trichopython rubrum so here we have lactic acid uh, bacteria isolates and these lactic acid bacteria isolates they try to produce metabolites to inhibit the growth of this um, microsporum as you can see the clear zone it means there's no growth of uh, microsporum whereas here the microsporum are everywhere so this is serve as the control plate um, for trichopython rubrum some of the isolates also showed uh, anti-mycotic or anti or fungicidal activity like there is no growth of uh, trichopython rubrum another uh, dermatophytes um, and as you can see we have clear zone here and this is the control plate and we can see that the trichopython is um, everywhere So if you're not interested with uh, lactic acid bacteria, you can also get bacteria from various sources. Uh, in this study, this is uh, what I did when I was in uh, my master's, I tried to obtain marine epibiotic bacteria from corals and macroalgae. So I actually collected only the mucus of corals and collected uh, bacteria from the surface of macroalgae. Um, oh, so for, for the mucus of course we do serial dilution and uh, plate inoculation and of course we isolated colonies and in my case i am only interested with pigmented uh, 
colonies or pigmented marine epibiotic bacteria. So where did I get my isolate? Of course, you have your corals like Parites, Calacea, Fungia, and Platygiaria. Um, and for algae, I use Salaminea and Galaxaurea. So in my study, again, I isolated colonies of bacteria. I'm very interested with pigmented bacteria, but why pigmented bacteria? So in a lot of literatures, they mentioned that pigmented bacteria have more bioactivity compared to non-pigmented uh, bacteria. The pigments, sometimes they have bioactivity. These pigments uh, can act as antimicrobial agent, um, as an antibiotic, as a vitamin precursor, and etc. So after the purification, so we have now here pure colonies, we extracted the uh, 16-SRRNA uh, of these uh, colonies and for identification. And uh, we found out that um, these isolates uh, they belong to uh, actinobacteria, bacilli, alpha protea bacteria, and gamma protea bacteria. And if, when we compare the sequences in the uh, NCBI or the database, uh, these are the um, identity of our uh, isolates. So to test the bioactivity of these isolates, uh, we do a simple screening. So first, we, um, of course, grow the isolates in a marine uh, broth, okay? And then um, we centrifuge to remove the pellet or the bacteria. And after centrifuge, we also filter sterilize the, um, the broth. This filter sterilization, of course, will ensure that there's no uh, isolates present in uh, the supernatant. That's why we call it cell-free uh, culture supernatant. And then, of course, we have this plate, and this plate contains the uh, cancer cells or the cell culture. And we put the culture supernatant together with uh, the cancer cells or the cells and examine whether the supernatant is anti, uh, have anti proliferation or can kill the uh, cell culture. So among our cell culture, we use cancer cells, colon cancer cells, breast cancer cells, and leukemia. And for normal cells, uh, we use human dermal fibroblasts. So why we need to use normal cells? So this is to ensure that the um, products released by um, the isolate cannot harm our normal cells, but rather can kill uh, cancer cells. And to determine the viability of the cell or the percentage of cell death, we use the resacerin cell viability assay. This is a, or presto blue. This is a blue pigment. And then when the cells being tested are still alive, they will convert this resacerin to resoferin, which is a, a pink color uh, pigment. So for antimicrobial assay, I also utilize the same thing with my colleague Genesis Alkawili. Um, so for my antimicrobial, I use most of the time the agar overlay method. So in this case, I, uh, of course, uh, culture the isolate and, uh, of course, pour a soft agar with the uh, pathogenic uh, bacteria. So interestingly, um, the isolates that we can find uh, uh, on, in mucus of corals um, showed no cytotoxic activity against normal uh, dermal uh, fibroblasts. So it means it's not toxic for normal cells. But uh, in case of the HP-1, uh, which is a leukemia cell line, it also didn't show um, uh, cytotoxicity. So it means it cannot kill uh, the leukemia cell line. However, uh, when we examine 
HT29 and HT116, some of the isolates here is almost same with the our control drug, which is bleomycin. Bleomycin is the control to kill uh, the cells. So it means there the activity of the uh, cell free culture supernatant are similar with the bleomycin. So it means they can kill uh, colon cancer cell, which is very interesting. And uh, we also found out that some of the isolates uh, can kill MCF-7 uh, or this breast cancer cell line. Because of that, uh, we are very intrigued with one of the isolate, which is Zushikela uh, isolate. Because Zushikela is pigmented like red colonies and, they ha and Zushikela possesses um, cytotoxic activity against cancer cells. So after the screening, we found the isolate Zuzikela showed uh, cytotoxic activity. So we further investigate Zuzikela. So again, the Zuzikela is um, red pigmented bacteria. And we, when we get the culture-free supernatant and followed by uh, extraction of the pigment, like um, solvent extraction, we get this red um, pigment uh, crude extract. We get this red crude extract. And then further, we uh, tried to uh, do column uh, fractionation used in this crude extract. And of course, we generate these different um, fractions um, and we tested for antimicrobial activity. So uh, from this, we can locate which fraction contains the antimicrobial or anti-cancer activity. And uh, so in this uh, result, we just use the uh, the crude extract. Okay, so the crude extract still showed um, cytotoxic activity against MCF-7 and MDA-MB231. MMDA231 is um, another uh, breast uh, cancer cell line. And here is a colony formation assay, and we found out that uh, it can suppress the growth of, um, of course, the colony formation of MCF-7 and MDMB231. So what do we mean by this colony formation assay? So we see that the cell lines or the cancer cell uh, here uh, on the plate, and then um, the purple color indicates the growth of the um, cancer cells. But here we have no color, like no purple color, it means there is no growth of uh, cancer cell. So furthermore, I tried to investigate um, the antimicrobial activity of this isolate Zuzikela. So here B1 is the Zuzikela and the rest are the other isolate. I found out that the other isolate doesn't have antimicrobial activity but except Sojikela against uh, Staphylococcus aureus. And here we also have uh, five uh, MRSA strain of Staphylococcus aureus, and the Sojikela exhibited uh, anti-MRSA uh, activity. So from this uh, phylogenetic tree and bioactivity of the isolates, the Zushikela showed uh, anti-MRSA as well as anti-cancer activity. That's why I'm very interested with this uh, isolate. So uh, take note, um, these are the screening purposes and uh, we can further uh, purify uh, our crude uh, supernatant. So, so most of the time, after cytotoxic and antimicrobial assay, the next activity is to determine the mechanistic approach, and we can do qPCR, Western blood ELISA, and metabolomic study. And in this case, we can consider markers for cell cycle, apoptosis, antioxidant, and metabolites. And of course, the cancer, which is my interest, uh, of course, has a lot of signaling pathways. And... Uh, to make the story short, uh, when I tested when I tested the um, my isolate against uh, some cellular signaling that causes um, 
that is highly activated in cancer cells, the zoshikela, okay, uh, can, okay, the zoshikela can inhibit the cellular signaling activated in cancer cell. And those signaling we have here, ERK and CRAP uh, signaling in both MCF and MDAMB231, which are breast cancer cells. And uh, another thing, so this experiment is about the mit mitochondrial activity of uh, MCF-7. And when I expose the cells with the Sushikela extract, uh, we found out that the, the mitochondria is inhibited. Okay, so the mitochondria or the mitochondrial respiration is the inhibited and the ATP production of the mitochondria is inhibited uh, in MCF-7. Uh, surprisingly, another breast cancer cell line, when we tested the extract of Sojikela, uh, the ATP production of the mitochondria and the mitochondrial activity is also uh, inhibited. But in terms of glycolysis, again, we are studying, I'm studying the metabolism of uh, cancer cell in terms of mitochondria and glycolysis, the extract from Zojikela didn't actually affect the glycolytic process. So it means that the extract is so specific with the uh, mitochondria. And if we look at the structure of the mitochondria before and after the treatment, so this is the before treatment. The mitochondria structure is elongated, but after the treatment, the mitochondria is starting to become round or like what we call apoptotic mitochondria. So we get congruent result with MDMB231. We also get this spherical, like this very round shape aggregate of the mitochondria after exposing uh, MDMB231 with Sushikela extract. So the thing is, uh, the isolates um, the we get from uh, fermented products or from corals or other sources, uh, we can investigate them for their beneficial uh, activity uh, through, of course, simple screening, and of course, crude uh, extraction using uh, various solvent. So uh, what does it mean? Uh, we have a lot of beneficial bacteria compared to pathogenic bacteria. And these bacteria can help us in health related uh, as well as uh, industrial related and so on. And bacteria are cultivatable and they are, we can uh, make media in the laboratory and of course to produce uh, of course to feed the bacteria and we get the important metabolites from these bacteria so at the end of the day we define human as human and microbes and technically more microbes than human and since human uh, of course we have the arts we have and the study of freedom, the language, the arts, philosophy, politics, poetry, culture, and society, we try to understand this uh, aspect of humans. And take note, because we are not just human alone, we are also microbes, and therefore we should also um, understand these, the arts in microbial way, okay? And that's the challenge of microbial humanities. So most of the time, we are trying to uh, teach or study microbes like too technical, the parts, the structure, the chemical composition. But the best thing is to learn microbes the way it affects our humanities and our health. So what's interesting about Berlin Science Week is they have this uh, microbiome appreciation uh, week. And in here they are uh, of course, uh, have these impressions from cooking for microbiome. And the biochemists try to explain how the balanced diet and fermentation benefits the gut microbiota. When we are studying bacteria in high school and college, um, the thing is, we are just studying the pathogens. And uh, 
uh, the pathogens causing disease and these are the bacteria causing acne, these are bacteria causing uh, pneumonia, these are bacteria causing tuberculosis. But there is uh, more than that. There are bacteria that are beneficial and th there are bacteria that maintaining our health and maintaining our lifespan. So, um, so for all the students and teachers out there, so I hope this lecture has given you a new perspective on studying microbiomes. Uh, thank you very much and take care of your uh, microbiomes. Ayan. So thank you po, Dr. Jason, for that very insightful lecture on microbial metabolites. So ang dami niyo pong na-cover and ang clear po ng explanations niyo. So thank you for that. So... Uh, actually, po, microbio and cell bio are some of uh, some of the courses back in my undergraduate days that I truly enjoyed because it's interesting and ang complex po pala ng mga microbes. So I hope na inspire po ang mga educators natin ngayon na incorporate po ang microbio and cell bio sa mga uh, syllabus po natin. Kasi marami po talaga ang pwedeng pag-aralan sa uh, sa microbio, cell bio, molecule bio, and so on, like Dr. Jason said. So we will now proceed to the Q&A portion. So if you're watching through Zoom, kindly use the Q&A feature to ask your questions. And when asking a question, uh, please state your name and your affiliation so we may recognize you. Okay, so for the Q&A portion, once again, let us welcome Dr. Jason. So good morning po. <laughs> Sorry. Good morning. Po? <laughs> Okay. So, habang naghihintay, uh, check ko lang po yung hand. Ayan po. So, habang naghihintay po tayo ng questions from the participants, uh, I guess to kick off uh, itong Q&A po, ako na lang po unang magtatanong. So, ang first, uh, ang question ko po ay, uh, since marami po kayo na cover ng mga topics po sa lecture nyo, uh, Ano po kaya yung sa tingin nyo, or for you po, what fascinates you the most in your line of research po? Um, I think uh, I'm very interested with microbiome. So as of now, our understanding in microbiome is not fast enough to understand human health. And microbiomes like we have a lot of microbial genes in our body we have more microbial cells in our body and technically it's affecting our health in different ways so still the research for microbiome are still uh, developing and we are still looking for uh, ways to uh, identify or treat diseases or link it with our microbiota. So the fascinating thing for me is with understanding uh, our microbiome, we can tailor um, um, treatment. So the treatment is dependent to the microbiota of person. So I think if we have ways to identify the different microbiota or um, profile the microbiota of person, we can des design better treatment for them for cancer, diabetes, and so on, something like that. Okay, po. so thank you for that. Po. So uh, related to that, po, sinabi nyo, meron pong question uh, in our chat box from uh, Ma'am Minette of uh, Philippine Science High Bicol Region. So ang tanong po niya, uh, do you have any insight about gut microbiome to type 2 diabetes development? Um, usually the type 2 diabetes is like it occurred due to um, most of the time through diet. And uh, technically when there's a high influx of fatty acid, it can, uh, those fatty acid can um, stress the uh, beta cells of the pancreas. And once the beta cells of the pancreas undergo some stress, they, uh, of course, produce less insulin or pwede silang mamatay. Um, the thing is, um, in terms of uh, microbiome, there are a lot of study telling that the microbiome composition of our gut affects the our eating behavior 
as well as the obesity. And as I showed in my lecture, like yung microbiome from obese person can induce also obesity from the mice. And once we get a healthy um, fecal or a healthy fecal for FMT treatment, uh, we can um, revert like uh, pwede natin i-convert yung obese mice to lean mice again with the correct microbiome. So, um, yeah, so I think that's the relationship of microbiome with type 2 diabetes. Okay, po. So, uh, thank you po. Uh, next question po we have from uh, Jamil Narwafa po. Uh, how can we determine po that a bacteria or a microorganism is deadly or could help to treat diseases po? So, uh, are there any structure, uh, structures or characteristics po na similar? Po? Um, take note that um, in terms of microbiome, like I told you, we have microbiome in oral cavity. And those microbiome are exclusive for our oral cavity. But there is a hypothesis that once the microbiome of our oral cavity or those bacteria travels to other parts of the body, sometimes we can uh, call them like pathogenic or they can visit negative effects. So um, the thing is, uh, we can check the virulence factor, like um, yung composition of the flagella or the capsule and so on to determine if it's uh, likely to be deadly or not. So like something like that. So in terms of structure and their relationship with uh, other bacteria, phylogenetic um, the relationship with other pathogenic bacteria. Okay, so ayan po. So may mga, may, meron nga po tayo mga characteristics na medyo common po or mga phylogenetic relationships po sa mga ibang pathogenic or uh, microorganisms po. Okay, so next question po from Sir Paul Chanko from NU Fairview. Ang question niya po ay, bakit po palaging mice ang ginagamit sa experiments sa pagtest po ng microbiome? So may ibang species pa po bang pwedeng magamit for experiments ng microbiomes po? Uh, yeah, because um, among um, species na pwedeng gamitin for research, like yung mice yung almost identical for humans since they are mammals. But we can also use other animals like uh, C. elegans and Drosophila. We also have like fishes, even poultry. We can use that for microbiome uh, study. So for like most economic yung cheaper, like economical yung C. elegans. Um, marami rin researcher, they use C. elegans. But the thing is, again, we don't share a lot of um, genes na similar to C. elegans. So, um, so sometimes mahirap i-translate. But uh, again, C. elegans also um, is a, a cheap uh, model for um I like animal testing. Um, actually, in terms of human, we could also do microbiome study for human, but maraming paper works for human <laughs> clinical studies. And uh, usually when we're studying microbiome, it's very important that the subject or young specimen are germ-free so we can exclude other factors. But in in case of human, we cannot do germ-free human, like uh, something like that. So that's why we use uh, mice in most of the study. So yun po yung reason kung bakit mice po ang kadalasang ginagamit po. So uh, another question po from James Elian Garlit of uh, UP Baguio po. So sabi niya, uh, what... Ang tanong po niya, what are the trends and considerations po in using broad-spectrum antibiotics in the public health setting? So how is a uh, Philippine healthcare system shifting to more specific treatments for infections to retain the normal gut microbiota community? Uh, yeah, actually, this is a very interesting question. Um, 
actually, I wanna put something before, like I just omit that. Um, there is a study about the microbial community. So they started the study using uh, checking the microbiome of an infant. Um, so yung infant, technically their microbiome, if it's normal delivery, their microbiome composition, especially their stool, is similar to the um, microbiome of the vagina from mother. However, if it's cesarean uh, section, the microbiome of those um, babies delivered through cesarean section is similar to microbiota of the uh, skin of their parent or yung mom nila. So what happened in their experiment, uh, it took them two years, they found out that even single dose of antibiotics to relieve in ear ear infection for those babies can actually affect dramatically the microbiota composition of the babies. So it can either delay the formation of microbiota of the babies to adult microbiota and so on. So technically the use of broad spectrum antibiotics may harm us because uh, it can change our microbiota community. So that's why we do not promote the use of antibiotics. So we should consult a doctor and like to determine the disease or something like that. Because again, uh, instead of helping us, it might uh, harm us. It promotes more infection in the future or other kinds of metabolic disease. Okay po. So thank you po. The very insightful po yung uh yung sagot nyo po. Uh, uh next po we have uh Sir uh Sir Roland Hipol from UP Baguio. So sabi niya po, thank you Dr. Jason for your informative lecture. So I don't know if I just missed it, but is FMT still in clinical trial or is it already performed in humans as a regular treatment regimen? Um, I'm not very sure if it's already a regular treatment regimen, but some hospital, they are practicing FMT. Um, I'm not sure if it's still a clinical trial, Sir, sir Hippol, but yeah. I'm also looking forward for FMT and like the stool bank in the Philippines in the future. It's also a good idea that when we are young, we can um, store our stool. So if we get uh, metabolic syndrome or diseases in the future or some problem in our gut, we can retrieve those um, healthy stool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yun po. Uh, thank you po. Uh, my follow-up question po si Ma'am Minette. Uh, ang, ang question niya po is, are medical doctors slash internists aware of the apl- application of gut microbiome to certain diseases to minimize prescription of synthetic drugs? Um, in U.S., uh, the, they actually consider FMT to treat like clostridium difficile infection, but I'm not sure in the Philippines uh, if we are um, using FMT to treat uh, clostridium difficile infection. Oh, sige po. So, meron po tayong questions, uh, question din po from YouTube. Uh, this is by Lilia Rabena po. Uh, I-chat ko na lang din po yung question niya para mabasa niyo po. So, is there a possibility that autoimmune diseases could be reversed when diagnosed early po? Um, I'm not very sure of the autoimmune diseases. So, okay. it's not really my my area so um yeah <laughs> sige po so yun uh, uh sabi po ni sir hipo dito po uh, biobanking of healthy gut microbiota is an interesting field of research po so yun po may other questions pa po kaya sila Wait, habang naghihintay po tayo so uh we are aware naman po na 
uh, kamahalan po yung ganitong field, yung microbiology po, molek bio, sal bio, sa, especially po dito sa Philippines. So, uh, ano po kaya ang pwede natin magawa para po ma-encourage pa rin po ang students and uh, also our institutions to invest more on medical research or microbi- microbial research po? Oh yeah, like it's quite expensive, but take note, we can modify the media. And before, um, like I had a senior high student before, we don't have this autoclave in the class. So we just borrowed uh, the, what's that? Pressure cooker, <laughs> their pressure cooker. So we tried to uh, sterilize everything using pressure cooker and we use our homemade uh, media. Take note, um, microbiome or the microbes, technically, like bacteria, uh, we can find them everywhere. And sometimes the best um, media for that is where we can isolate those microbes. So we can turn yung potato or yung sea water into um, media. And uh, so we just need to limit yung ano natin scope for research. So we use this kind of media, um, sea water media with agar and so on. And we check those bacteria that grows there and we um, characterize or check the um activity against some pathogens. So yeah, technically medyo um medyo mahal yung um research, mahal talking research. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sige po. So thank you po. Very interesting po na mayroon po pala mga ways para ma-adapt po talaga sa classroom activities itong mga uh, pag-research po ng mga microbiome. So yun nga po sa sa pressure cooker po and yung mga agar. Sana po yung mga educators po natin ngayon makahanap din po sa ng ways of adapting yung mga protocols po natin for studying uh, studying yung mga uh, microorganisms po. Uh, so uh, may other questions pa po kaya? Wait lang po. So, my ang last question na lang po is, uh, would there be any partnerships po or scholarships available that you know of for our teachers and also for our students uh, that are in, who are interested in pursuing the same field? Um, uh, partnership. Yeah, I'm, I'm open. Like, if you're interested with microbiology and you want to pursue research with microbiology, and you want to consult with, with me, so I'm open. I can give you my, my email, okay? And um, right now, I'm also, I will pursue my postdoc, and I'm going to study microbiota. So if there are opportunity out there, do sa Pukutan Kong School, so, and if you're interested in studying microbiota with me, so I can invite you, like, always open. Okay. Uh, yun po. So sa mga interested po sa atin, sa mga participants, sana po uh, pwede nyo po siyang i-contact. Ba- uh, baka pwede nyo pong i-chat po yung email nyo para ma- ma-contact po kayo ng mga participants. So uh, yun po. So once again, thank you uh, Dr. Jason for sharing your knowledge and your experience uh, and for answering the questions of the participants. So now I am going to award uh, the certificate of appreciation to Dr. Jason. So allow me to read the content or allow me to read the contents. So this certificate of appreciation is presented to Dr. Jason M. Antonio. Naka, iba po. So for serving as, wait lang po, <laughs> nagkakagulo po yung tech teams. So wait lang po. So yun po sa mga chat, uh, they are thanking you po for the very informative, uh, insightful lecture po. So hintayin ko lang po yung... <laughs> Okay, yan po. So, uh, again, <laughs> this Certificate of Appreciation is presented to Dr. Jason uh, M. Antonio for serving as a research speaker for the talk entitled Health-Related Applications of Microbial Metabolites. So, during the virtual 27th Summer Institute in the Natural Sciences and Mathematics with the team Upgrading Senior High School Science and Mathematics Education Content and Competency Part 2. And with the Department 
development of biology sub team rekindling appreciation of biodiversity from classroom to community held April 27, 2022, signed by Prof. Meiji. Uh, Baganga, who is the chair of uh, the Cynism Committee, and also the dean of the College of Science, Dimfna and Javier. Okay, po. So thank you very much once again to Dr. Jason. Let us all give a virtual round of applause po, for his lecture in his time. Po. Thank you, po. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, okay, <laughs> so uh, once again, uh, yun po. Thank you, Dr. Jason. And uh, now, before we get into the, sec the next lecture, po, we will first have a 15-minute break. Po. So, or wait lang po. Um, baka hindi po kakayanin ng 15-minute break. So, mga uh, five-minute break na lang po, or around eight minutes. Po. So, uh, uh, the next lecture will be on fungal bioresources and uh, Prof. Meiji Baganga, who is the current Cynism Chair, will be taking over the moderating of the program. So with that said, uh, thank you to everyone who participated or who listened to uh, Dr. Jason's lecture and we will see you at uh, 10, 10 .05. Okay, So a uh, short break now. Thank you.
Ayan po. All right. Thank you again, Doc Jason and Mang Kautar, for the interesting sharing on microbial metabolites. Okay, surely our participants have appreciated their own microbiota, and also they surely have appreciated na hindi na lang talaga sila magesa. Okay, so for the next lecture, also related to human health, we will be having another lecture on a different group of organisms, which are on fungi, naman po. So. To introduce our speaker for the next lecture, okay, um, it is my privilege to introduce to you our next speaker. He is among esteemed university professors here in the University of the Philippines, Baguio, who was also recognized as a UP scientist one, a title that only a few are able to attain. He took BS Biology at the Ateneo de Manila University and took Master of Science in Botany and PhD Botany in the, at the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. During his PhD, he worked on his dissertation, Endophytic Yeasts of Fermitas Australis in Copper Contaminated Mine Tailing Spawn in Mangkayan, Benguet. From this, his numerous works and researches on fungi started receiving funding from various local and national agencies, including, but are not limited to, the Cordillera Studies Center, the, D the DOST PCHRD, the UPECWRG, also the CHED there too, and the, P and the PCHRD to class LUNAS. And recently, his projects received funding from the National Research Council of the Philippines and the DOST Fisherd. He has also shared much of his researches to the public, having authored, co-authored, and contributed, and contributed to various publications in peer-reviewed and refereed journals. Contributing this much to the body of knowledge, specifically on the group of fungi, he has received various academic awards, some of which including international publication awards, the UP Gawad Chancellor for Best Faculty, and recently, the one UP Professorial Chair. He is also a member of many professional organizations, including the Mycological Society of the Philippines. Administratively, he has served a lot of functions and roles in our university. But for now, he is busy and very much performing as the assistant to the vice chancellor for academic affairs, specifically under the research sector. I may personally know him as my mentor in teaching evolutionary biology, but he has also taught many other biology, botany, and ecology courses. So for all of us to experience learning from one of the finest teachers and mentors in our university, here to, here to share with us his talk entitled Fungal Bioresources, Promising Bioactivities of Fungi for Human Health. Let us all warmly welcome Dr. Roland M. Hipol. Sir Don? Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Meiji, for the very generous um, introduction. It's uh, um, very humbling to uh, be introduce in such a way. Yeah, thank you very much for, for that. And for this particular session, of course, I would like to thank the presence of everyone uh, having spared their time to um, uh, share with us and to um, learn from the different lectures that you have already listened to uh, for the past uh, two days and an hour uh, or more uh, this morning. So. Um, as mentioned, the talk will be on uh, fungal bioresources, the promising bioactivities for human health. Uh, for context, I would like to cite the, the sub-theme of, of our cynicism, which is on uh, uh, biodiversity uh, and its connection to uh, the, the community. So uh, it started out, of course, with the, all the different lectures that I've already uh, seen, starting out with um, the lectures of uh, professors Reginaldo and uh, uh, Ms. Kim Paglingayan, and then the lectures um, yesterday by Prof. Bawanan and uh, uh, Prof. Dison, and of course the very informative lecture of uh, 
uh, Prof. Jason, and uh, hopefully um, I'll be able to contribute to the, the knowledge that I've already um, accumulated uh, uh, since Monday. And uh, citing the, the uh, conclusions, or at least the, the observations of Dr. Jason earlier, Dr. Antonio earlier, that um, it is one, uh, it is fun in a way to look at uh, microorganisms because uh, it impacts our uh, lives in such a way that we, we don't even rec recognize them because uh, they are so small and the effects are, um, uh, but the effects are so great that uh, we take them for granted. So in this, in this particular uh, lecture, we will try to look at uh, fungi, so the kingdom uh, fungi. So in relation to uh, the activities that I have had in the mention ni uh, Prof. Bagarao kanina, the, those are uh, the products or the results of, of hard work and of uh, very productive collaborations between uh, the people who have impacted my research and the people who have uh, greatly helped me and helped the institution Baggio, in the many researches that uh, the university has uh, tried to pursue. So in, at least in the researches, the recent researches that I was able to perform, I was um, in uh, uh, collaboration with the following uh, universities. So um, I have been collaborating with St. Louis University, uh, with Bengate State University, um, especially because um, these two universities are part of the um, Tuklas Lunas Development Consortium in the Cordillera. So nakita natin dun sa, dun sa, during the break, the, the slides that were uh, presented to you, uh, many of the laboratories that were established in the universities, the product of the in implementation of the, the Tuklas Lunas uh, uh, Consortium, which is composed of these three, three universities. Uh, but um, the, the success and the, the productivity of the consortium is very much uh, influenced and uh, improved by the, um, our collaborators from several uh, universities and more importantly, the universities, the, the, the faculty or professors from uh, UP Diliman, especially from the Institute of Chemistry at um, UD, UP Diliman because they served as our mentors um, in this particular research and in uh, the services or the, 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 uh, the instruments and the services available at the De La Salle University, which we have also tapped as collaborators. And uh, for and foremost, um, uh, as early as now, I would like to extend my uh, sincere uh, gratitude to our funding agencies because as mentioned by Dr. Uh, Jason Kanina, na this research or the researches on uh, uh, microbiota or any research for that matter will entail costs. So medyo uh, may mga equipment na medyo expensive in these types of researches and we are very grateful to the OST Philippine Council for Health Research and Development because they are the funding agencies that approved our proposals uh, for the researches that were done, the post results or partial results or observations will be presented uh, during this um, lecture. Okay, so for starters, uh, makita natin dito yung program frame, framework ng drug Disco discovery program or the Tuklas Lunas uh, Development uh, Program of the Department of Science and Technology. It, it all starts out with a biodiversity approach because uh, many of our uh, target um, source organisms are obviously local in origin. So at least for the consortium and for the entire Philippines, the Toplas Lunas uh, Development uh, Program, uh, most of which are coming from the plants, yung mga halaman. So alam naman natin na in our own um, uh, local communities, we have anecdotes of which plants would have a specific applications to the treatment of um, common um, illnesses or common um, discomforts. Alam natin yan, yung meron tayong mga uh, uh, 
Luya or um, Guava or Bawang, uh, Lagundi, and all the many other uh, plants that are uh, purported that purportedly have or has uh, specific um, activities. At uh, ginagamit namin, na, na, natin yun sa Toplas Lunas uh, Development uh, Program as, as uh, inspirations or as, as ideas. And then we let them go through a battery of tests to ensure or at least to check whether um, there is indeed a scientific uh, basis for the use of these uh, plants. And upon, uh, upon uh, establishment of the scientific basis, may be uh, the basis for the, for the production of uh, products later on. So in this case, in this uh, uh, figure, may dalawa tayong uh, tracks. So meron tayong herbal track at meron tayong uh, drug track. So dito sa herbal track, um, ito yung series of activities that essentially leads to uh, standardized herbal drugs. So ito yung mga... Uh, for, ang example natin dito yung mga MX3, yung, uh, yung Ampalaya Plus, yung uh, Lagundi Capsules. So, um, and there are others na hindi na-isolate yung um, uh, active, uh, uh, bioactive compound. At yun yung kaibahan ng herbal track sa drug track. Because uh, in the drug track, um, this is where the, the process, the, the chemical process of isolation, purification, and actual compound ID is performed. So yan yung uh, nangyayari dun sa drug track. Dito sa, dito sa UP Baguio, we have the laboratory of uh, Dr. Chodora Balangpon uh, following the herbal track. Also, the laboratory of Dr. Luisa Plagio at BSU, and the laboratory of uh, Dr. Regina Hipol at SNU. Yun yung uh, uh, ginagawa nila. They are trying to um, make products out of uh, the existing uh, biodiversity, perform all of these battery of tests to make uh, herbal, uh, herbal drugs or herbal medicines without actually identifying or they, there may, pwedeng mayroong uh, um, cursory identification ng laman ng compound, but there is no, ay, laman ng, ng capsules, pero hindi, not, hindi nila um, ina-isolate at pinag-purify uh, yung compound. And uh, on my part, I am trying to follow the drug track, and, pero hindi lahat ito, ah. Hanggang, uh, hindi lahat ito, I'm just trying to look at uh, the possible uh, identities of the compounds and trying to, as much as possible, perform the purification step uh, to the extent that uh, the laboratory is capable. So, so this is the program framework which governs the, the TUPLAS develop, to DUNAS development uh, program of the uh, DOST. Okay, so in relation to uh, the sources of the fungi that I, I took for my research, um, I, I isolated uh, this fungi from common plants that are found here in the Cordillera. So, uh, of course, I took uh, the team uh, took uh, soil samples and isolated uh, fungi from soil samples. We also took uh, sa mga readings siguro ninyo yung mga um, meron tayong mga fungus and bacteria that are referred to as endophytes. So what are endophytes? Endophytes are uh, microorganisms that are found um, to be surviving and uh, living within the tissues of plants without causing or at least without um, manifestations of external uh, symptoms of disease. So makikita natin na meron natural, in the same way that meron tayong commensal flora sa ating gut, sa ating skin, meron ding um, uh, natural flora yung mga halaman 
dun sa interstices of the cells uh, between the in, between the cells of the the plants and on their uh, you know, superficially as epiphytes on their leaves on their stems and on their roots and um, the fungal endophytes are, are a prime candidates for the discovery of possible uh, bioactive compounds uh, because um, they do not exhibit any external manifestation of disease. And there is a um, natural um, inference that uh, there is a mutualistic relationship between the plant and the endophyte if it doesn't cause uh, external manifestation of disease. So there is a mutual uh, relationship, mutual benefit between these uh, two organisms. And that unique environment or that unique interaction between the fungus and the plant is a uh, very rich and fertile uh, um, research uh, field, um, especially that they are not uh, frequently researched upon. Uh, sabi sa um, sabi sa lecture ni or sa paper ni Hawksworth, um, he has mentioned that approximately there are around 1.5 million uh, species to even 1.7 million species of fungi, and parang around uh, five to ten percent lang yung nakikilala sa kanila. Many of them are not yet uh, described; they are not yet investigated, and the internal tissues of the plants are uh, very uh, um, prolific sources of um, fungi that may be the target um, research uh, or the, the targets of researches pertaining to uh, different researches in this particular case for the discovery of uh, important uh, medicines in, in the future. So in this case, as mentioned, uh, this slide contains pictures of the the plants that I have investigated. So meron tayong uh, thalloid liverwort uh, na Marcantia. So marami dito sa uh, Baguio City nito. Um, itong um, giant tree fern, itong um, Sayatea. Meron tayong, of course, popular naman itong uh, Baguio City sa pine trees. So I took uh, pine needles and tried to isolate uh, endophytic punta from the pine needles. Um, Ito din, itong wild uh, strawberry, yung pinit. Uh, parang maram, meron din yata ito sa uh, non-cordillera region. So in, in your region, you may find them also. I took some of the leaves also and tried to isolate um, endophytes from them. Another fern, um, uh, Dicranoctrinis uh, linearis, and uh, uh, two angiosperms, or uh, rather three, uh, so four angiosperms, pala. itong pinit, itong sunflower representing dicots. And we have monocots here. We have the common weed dito, yung Sencrus polystachios. And we have uh, this um, plant I, I, I was able to get from uh, Mangkayan, itong Phragmites australis. So looking at, well, I tried to as much as possible. I took um, one from the bryophytes, two from the ferns. Uh, one gymnosperm, two uh, dicot angiosperms, and two uh, di uh, monocot angiosperms. So try to I tried to spread out the the distribution of uh, or the, the the thrust of isolating endophytes from the different the different classes of uh, of angiosperms or kinds of angiosperms. Of course, it started out with the isolation of uh, the fungus. And um, in the process of isolating uh, endophytic fungi, what I performed, what the team performed, was to uh, primarily perform uh, surface sterilization. Para uh, sure tayo na, or pataas yung, yung possibility that what grows are those that are inside the leaf tissues and not those on the on the surface, yung mga epiphytes. So the surface sterilization was performed. But for epiphytes, what was done was um, the leaves themselves, they were um, um, immersed in uh, water agar para madislodge yung mga spores from the surface of the, of the leaves. And then they were uh, poured and plated on, on the 
on agar. Ito yung ito yung aming mga uh, isolation rates ng mga ng mga kunja. After isolation and purification, of course, pur isolation and purification of the the fungi, uh, they were kept in uh, microtubes in glycerol and they were kept in the in the refrigerator for a long term storage. Okay, and na uh, well aside from that, so syempre, after isolation will be yung identification kasi um siguro na emphasize din sa inyo sa plants na kapag hindi natin kilala yung inaaral natin ay walang uh, grounding yung ating uh, research parang it, if it remains a species one fungus species two fungus it is not uh, as informative as when it gets identified uh, to the species level however as mentioned uh, earlier not a lot has been discovered in terms and described in the the fungal kingdom such that many of our isolates remain to be uh, like penicillium sp or aspergillus sp after uh, molecular identification because uh, there is the the percentage homology and uh, the many other measures of similarity uh, does not um, uh, fulfill the requirements of it being uh, named as conspecific to the to those that are already named in the database so they remain um, um, well the, the complete uh, species is not uh, provided for because of that they may be uh, designated into their uh, specific genomes or even families but uh, many of those were not identified to the species level which is at the same time exciting because they may not they may not be uh, described at this time but uh, that's another taxonomic problem Okay, so um, after isolating the fungus, what is next is to perform batch fermentation. And batch fermentation is uh, the, the multiplication of the uh, mycelia in several uh, growth media. In what we use is uh, potato dextrose broth na half strength. So half strength na potato dextrose broth yung ginagapit namin. And then we use um, itong uh, shaker incubator. So umiikot-ikot yan. Uh, Nag-shake siya para uh, ma-shake yung um, uh, broth para uh, ma-irate ma primarily yung broth para mag magkaroon ng growth ng mycelia. The temperatures usually that uh, we use here is around 30 uh, degrees Celsius. And this is to uh, facilitate the growth of uh, non pathogenic so, uh, to to mimic the environment the growth uh, environment at this as per temperature dun sa mga na isolate naming mga environmental um, fungi and this is also to limit the growth of possible pathogens kasi pag in increase natin yan ng 37 degrees um, celsius um na of course alam natin na yung body temperature natin uh, baka uh, bumaba yung growth rate ng mga ito dahil they are environmentally um, isolated and if ever they are environmentally isolated and if they are grown at 37 degrees baka sila ay um, human pathogens okay so after batch fermentation what we did was to harvest the broth kasi Ang aming, the hypothesis, of course, is that the metabolites are produced by the mycelia, the fungal mycelia, and they are secreted into the broth. And what we did was to harvest uh, the broth, and then we reduced in volume in vacuum. So, sa rotary evaporator, yung, uh, by the way, one batch of uh, fermentation broths for one species is around uh, 14 liters. So, yun yung goal namin para enough yung crude extract, we target around 14 liters of uh, broth. And then we have to reduce that 14 liters to around 300 ml. So, yun. so ito yung uh, rate limiting step actually in the process of the generation of the crude extract is how to reduce that 14 liters to around 300 ml. At ang gamit natin dyan ay yung uh, 5 liter rot rotary evaporators na available naman sa, sa lab. 
And then, once we reduce that to, uh, to 300 or even lesser, kasi tama yung nababawas pa na, na water doon sa fermentation broths, um, I, yung, the complete drying of the crude extracts is performed in this instrument here. So it's a solvent evaporation system which uses um, um, centrifugation. So umiikot itong uh, vial dito para yung liquid ay nasa walls ng, um, walls ng vial para yung uh, surface area is greatly increased and then may bumubuga na hot air dito Dito, para pinubugahan niya na umiinit yung umiinit yung bottle as it is uh, as it, as it is uh, turning and then the entire system is under vacuum para mas mabilis yung rate of evaporation ng liquids so um, this is a very um, useful um, tool or instrument to hasten the rate limiting step of trying to uh, get the crude extracts of the fermentation blocks. So it's called uh, the, the, the model is a V10, V10 touch. So meron siyang touch screen, meron siyang condenser para dun sa nag-evaporate to create that reagent ng, ng, um, ng solvent para mas mabilis na naman na mag-evaporate. So this was a very useful tool, tool for us or in equipment for us. So once we get the crude extracts, this is how uh, it looks like. So these are the vials. Kaya medyo brownish yung kanilang gilid. Dahil, dahil nga dun sa pag-ikot niya, dun sa pag-ikot niya, uh, dyan na rin nag-dry yung, uh, yung crude extracts. And these crude extracts are kept in minus 20 uh, freezers just to limit the, uh, the rate of degradation of the possible degradation of the compounds inside these good extracts. And then they are used in the different assays that were performed. It, so susunod na yung mga uh, in vivo assays na ginawa natin dito sa lab. Okay, so the first assay that was performed were the antibacterial activity assays. And um, na-highlight naman kanina dun sa lecture ni, uh, it was mentioned at least dun sa lecture ni Dr. Jason, that um, antibiotic resistance is a problem of uh, of our health uh, uh, systems because many of our existing antibiotics are no longer effective or as effective as they were before sa ating uh, mga pathogens. And in this particular slide gives us an idea of the many um, uh, mechanisms of antibiotic resistance. Like for example, for this, this um, uh, portion of the slide here, the antimicrobial resistance is because of the inactivation of the uh, antibiotic itself. Like uh, we have um, organisms or bacteria that uh, secrete uh, beta-lactamase um, enzymes. And what are beta-lactamase enzymes? They are those that actually cleave or um, um, they, they change the configuration of the compound, in this case, the beta-lactam antibiotics, such that they are no longer uh, effective antibiotics. Yeah. Ito din, itong amino, uh, aminoglycoside uh, uh, modification. Aminoglycoside is, again, a class of uh, antibiotics. So we have um, anti uh, we have... Um, antibiotic resistant bacteria that inactivate our um, antibiotics by actual uh, modification of the antibiotic. And another mechanism of um, uh, resistance is in their capacity to make uh, biofilms and to uh, make colonies or to be in colonies that are protected by biofilms. And if they are in biofilms, they have this covering which inhibits or at least reduces the rate at which the antibiotics are able to find and look at, uh, and uh, affect the bacteria. So meron silang cover na ganyan. Another is uh, we have um, bacteria that are able to modify their cell walls such that they, are, they can no longer be targeted by um, our existing antibiotics. So, pwede na lang 
i-modify yung kanilang cell wall na hindi na effective yung um, ating antibiotics. And the, uh, the last, or at least the fourth of the many um, mechanisms of uh, antibiotic resistance would be yung efflux of the antibiotics. So pumasok nga yung antibiotic, but they have uh, porins that are able to, or efflux pumps, that are able to pump out this antibiotic. So uh, present the antibiotics as surrounding, but if the antibiotics uh, mode of action is um, within the cells and if they are pumped out of the cells, then of course, these antibiotics are no longer um, effective. Um, we have this uh, acronym for the um, medically important um, pathogens that are also one uh, that are also um, developing um, antibiotic resistances to the many um, antibiotics that we we have at the, at, uh, currently. We have um, the genus Enterococcus, so the Enterococcus facial, uh, Enterococcus facial. We have a Staphylococcus uh, aureus. Meron tayong tinatawag di ba niyong methicillin uh, resistant um, and um, Staphylococcus aureus. Um, for the Enterococcus uh, facial, it is a typical uh, commensal in our gut and its effects usually are, its negative effects usually are highlighted or they, get, they become manifested, especially when um, there is um, uh, the, the, the patient or the person is immunocompromised. Um, other effects or, or other um, diseases that enterococcus facial is uh, associated to our uh, meningitis and endocarditis. It is also a uh, it is also gram positive. So for Staphylococcus aureus, it is also gram positive. It is also a common um, resident of our skin. But uh, again, kapag meron siyang uh, um, mechanism to be able to reach our soft tissues, mas nagiging nagkakosya ng cellulitis at saka meron kayong um, acne or boils. Um, usually makikita sila doon sa doon sa mga um, soft tissue infections na mga ganito. Okay. So the K, so that is the E and the S. The K stands for uh, Klebsiella pneumoniae. So this time this is a gram negative um, bacterium and it is also uh, got commensal but it is uh, oftentimes associated uh, to um, septicemia or bacteremia. So ito yung makikita itong bacteria na ito sa ating bloodstream. At saka it is also uh, a positive agent of factor, bacterial uh, pneumonia. Itong Klebsiella pneumonia. Itong Acinetobacter uh, uh, baumani, ito naman yung A. Acinetobacter baumani, it is also a gram-negative uh, bacteria it is also associated with uh, septicemia and bacteremia. It is also associated with uh, urinary tract infections, pneumonia. Um, so, yeah. so uh, itong bacteria na ito ay similar to Klebsiella pneumonia is also associated with lung infections. Itong Pseudomonas aeruginosa, common ito na soil bacteria, itong pseudomonas, and all the other pseudomonas. Uh, it is also gram-negative, and it is also associated with uh, pneumonia and septicemia and bacteria. And also associated with gastrointestinal infections. Again, itong mga ito ay uh, mas nagiging malakas or yung mas mataas. The degree of, uh, the degree of the, its negative effects are highlighted and uh, um, increased when the patient is immunocompromised. Ito yung P, ito yung pseudomonas. Itong E, ito naman yung enterobacter. Um, similar to the others, it is also associated with pneumonia, uh, UTI, and uh, uh, bacteremia or septicemia. And all of these are associated with um, nosocomial infections. Yung bagay, yung mga nakukuha natin sa hospital. Pag tumira tayo ng medyo matagal, doon sa mga ospital. 
uh, makukuha natin itong any of these escape uh, uh, bacteria. And because we get them from the hospitals, most probably they have also, they were already exposed to antibiotics and most probably have their specific mode of antibiotic resistance. And in this research, we tried to use uh, multi-drug resistant escape. So multi-drug uh, resistant escape and found that uh, there are a few of our uh, crude extracts and uh, a few of the fractions from these extracts, we have found them to be um, effective against uh, um, and eat, uh, many of these um, bacteria, which is of course promising because at the rate at which we are losing, quote unquote, our antibiotics to uh, resistance, we have to do our part to look for other uh, possible um, bioactive compounds that can increase our armament against these antibiotic resistant uh, bacteria. So how did we do it? So ano yung protocol na ginamit namin? The, the, the procedure here was uh, the resazorin uh, assay. So we have this compound we refer to as resazorin, and it is modified by the mitochondrion and convert it to resorufin, resorufin. So yan. So ang makikita natin dito itong functional group na ito, yun yung nawawala at siya yung nagiging resorufin. And how did we detect them? Well, there are two ways of detecting the presence of resorufin. So one is through absorbance using these two, um, these two uh, wavelengths here at 570 nanometers or at 600 nanometers kasi doon natin makikita na meron yung, yung peak ng uh, resorufin. At pwede rin naman fluorescence. Um, yung uh, sa fluorescence natin, meron tayong excitation um, wavelength and then it fluoresces the resorufin fluoresces at 590 uh, nanometers. So ano yung naging strat strategy namin dito? We have the escape bacteria. So meron tayong uh, non ng, or uh, at least a cross ng uh, bros ng um, escape bacteria, any of those escape bacteria, we place resazorin and we place our extra. Kapag na-detect na itong resoforin, ibig sabihin merong fluorescence at 590 uh, nanometers, ibig sabihin the bacteria is alive. Buhay yung bacteria. Kapag na-convert yung resazorin to resorufin. Pero kapag uh, yung bacteria ay namatay, so kapag uh, because of the presence of the fruit extract and um, uh, later on of the fractions from the fruit extracts at namatay yung bacteria, uh, the resazorin remains as resazorin dahil walang mitochondria. To, uh, or at least the, the cells pala, the, the bacteria itself. The, um, nakoconvert yan sa resorufin. At um, kapag uh, buhay yung bacteria, wala itong peak na ito. Hindi natin siya madedetect at 590 um, nanometers. Ayan. So yun yung aming strategy. If uh, kung namatay yung cells, wala kang madedetect na fluorescence. At kung nabuhay yung cells, ibig sabihin uh, kaya, niyang, kaya niyang mabuhay despite the presence of the the, the fruit extract and the fractions, may madedetect tayo uh, uh, fluorescence. But um, it can be detected um, with the um, eyesight, kumbaga, eyesight evaluation because the resazorin uh, itself looks uh, purple. Pero when it is converted to resazorin, it becomes pink. So it doesn't need to be subjected to a microplate reader. So makita mo lang yung microplate at uh, it remains viol uh, violet or blue. So uh, buha uh, patay yung mga bacteria doon. At kapag, um, kapag uh, nabuhay or buhay pa din yung mga bacteria, the plate or the well uh, appears pink. So it doesn't have to be, uh, it doesn't have to employ a microplate reader. Pwede yung uh, ocular inspection lang. Alam na natin na merong nabuhay pa o namatay pa. Of course, we need uh, controls here para meron tayong references. So yun yung ating sa 
antibacterial um, assay. Um, and we found out that there are uh, there are um, um, fungal isolates and fractions of the fruit extracts of these fungal isolates that are able to um, kill and control the the growth of uh, this escape bacteria. And we also tried to investigate itong resistance modifying activity of our extracts. So na mention natin kanina, di ba, na merong uh, me mechanism of resistance itong mga bacteria natin. And there is a way to modify this resistance to make them susceptible again. So ito yung actually goal ng resistance modifying activity. For example, uh, we have uh, penicillins. Uh, we know that penicillins are, are beta-lactam antibiotics. And what they do, what they do is that um, they interfere, they interfere with the cell walls, the, the, the cell wall of our target bacteria. And um, if they are uh, successful interfering in the um, synthesis of the, cell, uh, of the cell wall of our bacteria, then it results to bacterial death. However, um, nakita natin kanina na merong beta-lactamase. Meron tayong uh, beta-lactamase. Uh, meron tayong mechanism of penicillin resistance or me mechanism of uh, beta-lactam resistance. One is the presence of penicillin binding proteins. This is common in um, staph aureus. So meron, tayo, meron talaga silang uh, binding proteins na hindi na effective maski na buo yung yung molecule ng beta-lactam or ng penicillin, uh, kapag merong penicillin binding protein yung uh, ating bacteria, these uh, uh, penicillins are not able to uh, influence or they are not able to affect the uh, cell wall uh, formation. So, ineffective yung penicillins kapag merong penicillin binding proteins. The other is uh, the presence of beta-lactamases. We have several types of beta-lactamases. In this case, we have a serine beta-lactamase, and we have metallo, metallo beta-lactamases. Ito yung pinakabago actually, yung, and mas malaking problema ng mga uh, hospitals uh, kapag uh, meron ng uh, metallo beta-lactamase producing uh, escape bacteria. At ito namang nakita natin kanina na itong uh, beta-lactamases, they cleave uh, the beta-lactam antibiotic such that it no longer is able to um, affect uh, cell wall formation. So this is the mechanism of penicillin resistance of our escape. And, but we can modify uh, this resistance. And one very good uh, example of a beta-lactamase inhibitor ay itong uh, clavulanic acid. So it's the pinaka-una na na-discover na, na uh, beta-lactamase inhibitor. Kaya meron tayong uh, medicines, di ba? Na, um, ang generic name niya ay co-amoxiclav. Kasi it's, uh, siya ay pinagsama na amoxicillin at saka clavulanic acid. So combination therapy na, kung baga ang nangyayari dito, kasi na-assume ng inyong doctors na yung inyong, the bacterial uh, infection that you have is um, uh, resistant to the activity of uh, the amoxicillin, which is a beta-lactin antibiotic, kaya uh, nag-prescribe nag siya na merong clavulanic acid. Because the clavulanic acid, what it does is that it binds with the beta-lactamase enzyme such that it inactivates the beta-lactamase enzyme. So kapag inactivated na yung beta-lactamase, it is not able to cleave and to work on and act on the beta-lactam antibiotic. So, na-restore, na-ibalik natin yung activity ng ating uh, amoxicillin kapag merong clavulanic acid. So, kung meron tayong antibiotic, amox, uh, amoxicillin-resistant uh, antibiotic, uh, so, sorry, antibiotic-resistant bacteria or pathogen, and then there is a uh, beta-lactamase inhibitor then na, na ibabalik yung activity ng uh, antibiotic. So in this case, yung, the 500 and 125 milligrams, the 500 
is relating to the amount of the amoxicillin. And the 1 to 5 milligrams would refer to the amount in the uh, uh, clavulanic acid. We have others actually na mga combination therapies like uh, tasobactam, for example. Um, um, yun yung mga makikita ninyo na merong ganitong may slash. They are combination therapies possibly of, uh, of um, in this case, a betalactam and a uh, betalactamase inhibitor. So yun yung na parang naging model ng research namin. We tried to, um, we took a look at um, uh, the isolates and found those that are uh, ampicillin naman yung ginamit namin, ampicillin resistant at whatever concentration. So we used as much as 100 milligrams, 100, pp, 100 ppm ng ampicillin and then we combined them to uh, 10 uh, ppm and 100 ppm of our fruit extracts and of our fractions and we tried to see uh, if any of those combinations are able to um, control uh, any of the escape bacteria. So yun yung aming uh, beta-lactamase inhibition and we also have found promising um, ex fruit extracts and fractions dito. So nakakatuwa na uh, pwede palang Yung, yung model ng clavulanic acid ay kaya natin i-replicate sa uh, laboratory. Although, of course, with the uh, recognized uh, limitations of the lab, we can perform such types of experiments in trying to look for um, resistance-modifying um, compounds uh, similar to the activity of clavulanic acid. So, yeah, so we perform antimicrobials we perform resistance modifying against antimicro uh, against um, antibiotic resistant uh, organisms and we also perform or at least um, our collaborators also perform um, uh, hmg coa reductase inhibition ito naman yung anti cholesterolemia so yung pinaka kung meron tayong clavulanic acid sa sa resistance modification ng mga bacteria, yung popular naman na medicine natin dito sa anti-cholesterolemia ay yung mga statins. Malamang marami na sa atin. Actually, just recently I was prescribed uh, to use atorvastatin dahil medyo mataas daw yung aking mga lipids, this lipidemia daw. So itong HMG-CoA reductase is that enzyme that is responsible at the committed step, so it is a rate limiting uh, step that uh, eventually leads to the formation of cholesterol. So the formation of cholesterol. So kung ma-inhibit yung ating HMG-CoA, mas mababawasan yung uh, cholesterol sa ating dugo. So kaya tayo nag, uh, nag, nag, kaya nagpa-prescribe yung ating mga doctors ng mga statins because atorvastatin and all the other statins are... Um, inhibitors of HMG-CoA uh, reductase. So we also performed it, or at least our collaborators at UPD Um If you know uh, Dr. Hernandez, the lab of Dr. Hernandez, uh, Christine Hernandez in the Institute of Chemistry, they were the ones who performed this using the food extracts from our uh, fungal isolates. And um, you can, there is an article, by the way, we were able to publish uh, an article uh, on the, the efficacy of uh, crude extracts and isolates, fungal isolates inhibiting HMG CoA. But medyo mataas, very promising din itong uh, HMG CoA reductase inhibition capacity of the many fungi that we were able to isolate in this research. So it, it contributes to our uh, battery of um, medicines, hoping that uh, we have more. Um, uh, drugs to use, of course, obviously lesser yung dapat sana yung, yung negative effects niya. We hope we can contribute to the discovery of uh, many other compounds against uh, dyslipidemia, in this case, cholesterolemia. Um, we also tried looking for um, siderophores. Yeah. So itong mga siderophores naman ay, itong research ng siderophores was uh, funded by uh, UP uh, system, doon sa ECWRG. So what are siderophores? Sorry. 
Siderophores are compounds that are naturally secreted by bacteria and fungi. And the purpose of siderophores are uh, they are the ones that are has high affinity to iron. So high affinity to iron para and usually kasi itong iron siya yung medyo mababa yung yung amounts or quantities niya doon sa environment. So the presence of uh, siderophores are are uh, useful to bacteria and fungal cells uh, to be able to get the limited uh, amount of iron from the environment. At kailangan alam naman natin na yung iron is a very important um, um, ion doon sa physiology ng lahat ng living organisms, lalo doon sa oxidation reduction um, pathways sa ating, ating katawan. And when the bacterial cell, of course, gets this iron, then there is bacterial cell growth. So, so ano, yung, ano yung theory natin? Bakit natin hinanap yung mga siderophores sa mga fungus, sa mga fungi? Because uh, currently, uh, there are uh, several uh, siderophores already that may be used as, quote-unquote, uh, Trojan horses. Trojan horses. Alam naman natin, sana alam natin yung, yung, yung story about the Trojan horse. Right? So there were these two uh, warring um, cities and then supposedly we have this Trojan horse na it's, it was supposedly an act of peace na kaya nakapasok yung Trojan horse dun sa kanyang kalaban tapos sa loob pala ng horse, uh, sa Trojan horse na yun ay uh, marami palang mga soldiers doon. So ganun yung strategy na ginagawa dito sa siderophores. Uh, siderophores are, as mentioned, it's a common uh, compound that are uh, found in bacteria, even in pathogenic bacteria. So yung mga siderophores na yan, ay nililink, nililink natin yan sa mga drugs, sa mga antibiotics, na hindi madaling makapasok sa mga, sa mga bacterial cells. And kapag effective yung ating um, siderophore uh, drug um, linked uh, compound, then the bacteria doesn't know that there's already a, an antibiotic on that siderophore compound na kinuha niya. Kinuha niya. Diba? So yun. Um, kapag kumuha siya ng mga siderophores, pinapasok niya dun sa loob ng kanyang cell, yun pala ay may daladala ng antibiotics. So it increases the efficacy of uh, the antibiotics. So instead lang na uh, through diffusion or through um, yung assimilation, regular assimilation lang ng mga bacteria sa mga antibiotics na yan, uh, they are masked because they are linked with siderophores and they, the bacteria think that ang laman ng mga siderophores na yan ay iron. So they take it in at may laman pala silang uh, drugs. So um, na, nakita namin sa mga researches namin na meron tayong, the, this, this fungi are prolific sources of siderophores. Kaya lang hindi namin, at this time, hindi pa namin alam kung anong siderophores sila. So moving forward, uh, these siderophores that are uh, isolated, that we saw and detected in our our um, fungal isolates may be and possibly they can be used as uh, Trojan forces in the delivery, drug delivery of uh, antibiotics into the bacteria, pathogenic bacteria that we have uh, in uh, uh, affecting us. So, okay. so this, that is uh, in relation to uh, the, the siderophores or the assays for the siderophores that we perform. This is also the base of assay here. I, um, um, abs uh, absorbance din kaya lang yung wavelength na ginagamit natin dito ay uh, UV uh, spectrum. Um, we also tested um, our isolates, our crude extracts for alpha amylase inhibition and alpha amylase inhibition is one of the approaches in trying to regulate uh, blood glucose um, level because when we inhibit in this particular uh, figure here, we can see that alpha amylase together with uh, alpha glucosidase, it is one of the enzymes that contribute to the increase in blood glucose uh, levels. So if we can inhibit, in this case, alpha amylase, we can possibly reduce the amount of blood glucose levels. 
the laboratory that performed this assay for us was the lab of um, the lab of uh, Dr. Evangelina Moore of the Institute of Chemistry Ulet. And so they were able to find um, um, isolates or crude extracts from isolates that are able to inhibit um, the alpha amylase. And possibly, uh, may downstream pa, obviously may downstream researches pa ito na pwedeng gawin to elaborate on what they are and how they, how they do it. We also tested for um, the anti-inflammatory bioactivities. And in this case, uh, ito yung biology ng pain. Um, meron tayong dalawang enzymes that are associated with inflammation. Itong cyclooxygenase 1 and cyclooxygenase 2. And um, for cyclooxygenase 1, um, they are um, important for kapag meron tayong expressed na cyclooxygenase 1, at nakita natin dito constitutive dahil regular siyang uh, ginagawa, regular na ginagawa ng katawan natin. Importante sila dito sa mucosal protection, sa gastrointestinal uh, tract mucosal protection. Kasi alam naman natin na diba, acidic yung ating, there is HCL dun sa ating uh, stomach. So it's a very strong acid. Kaya uh, our uh, stomach lining needs to be protected against uh, the effect of uh, this strong acid. So kailangan may, may uh, mucous membrane dun sa ating um, gut or dun sa ating stomach. And that is uh, the action or the activity of the cyclooxygenase 1. It is also associated with um, the kidneys, the renal blood flow uh, for plated aggregation and in the, the activity of our endothelium in sa ating mga uh, 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 blood vessels. Okay, yung COX-2 naman, ito yung inflammation, uh, it is inducible such that when they are induced, they are associated with uh, this many uh, activities. So yung goal ng mga anti-inflammatory drugs natin is to inhibit COX-1 and COX-2 because even if, especially for COX-1, even if it is um, uh, produced constitutively, meron siyang nahahighlight na yung inflammation. So meron tayong mga gamot that inhibits COX-1 at meron tayong gamot that inhibits uh, COX-2. So familiar tayo dito sa mga gamot na ito. Naproxen, uh, ibuprofen, Ito yung uh, diclofenac, uh, selicoxib. So ito yung mga um, NSAIDs that are COX-1 specific. So it, NS8 is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And because they are COX-1 COX-1 uh, uh, inhibitors, what they primarily what they do is that they also limit the production of uh, mucous membrane in our stomach. So walang ang, walang ang pain, hindi na inflame. For example, uh, na tapilok. So meron tayong uh, inflammations sa ating ankles. So pwede tayong gumamit at may pain. For example, meron tayong toothache. So merong inflammation at merong pain. So pwede gumamit ng mga ganito. Ito mga na, so, naproxen, ibuprofen, uh, and all of this. However, uh, ang usual associate natin dyan ay yung nangangasib yung chan natin, di ba? Because, uh, bumababa yung uh, mucosal protection because there is selective inhibition of COX-1. Kaya meron tayong mga gamot na uh, preferentially they are also they are they are um, um, inhibiting COX-2 naman. So ito yung mga COX-2 selective yung mga COX-2 selective inhibitors. Ito ng mga COXIBs natin. Yung mga COXIBs Na ma, ito ang taas-taas ng COX-2 selectivity niya, 80% uh, selection, uh, selective inhibition for COX-2, uh, mas, uh, well, at this time, um, ma, medyo pricey siya as compared to the many non-selective uh, uh, or dun sa non-steroidal uh, NSAIDs, which may be non-selective, which may be uh, inhibiting COX-1 also. So itong mga COX-2, uh, nawawala yung pain, nawawala yung, o nababawasan yung pain, nababawasan yung, yung um, 
inflammation pero hindi nangangasim yung chan. Hindi nangangasim yung chan. But uh, meron pa rin namang uh, sabi na natin na meron siyang um, side effects kasi uh, nakikita or at least dun sa mga trials na gumagamit ng COX-2 meron naman siyang nag-i-increase naman yung risk dito ng uh, platelet aggregation naman yun. Yung problema for uh, COX-2 selective inhibitors. So meron tayong risk for uh, increased risk for stroke and increased risk for um, uh, heart attacks because of uh, yung capacity ng COX-2. Uh, kapag na-inhibit yung COX-2 ay um, nagkakaroon ng platelet um, inhibition, uh, platelet aggregation. So that is in relation to the, the anti-inflammation, anti-pain assays that we performed using um, the, the fungal extracts, crude extracts and fractions that we did, that we had from the plants that, we, that I showed you earlier. We also tried uh, looking at uh, gene regulation, yung parang uh, certain... Uh, by a certain degree, uh, metabolomics na ginagawa. So, uh, what is, uh, just for a background, what is gene regulation? Ito yung uh, either the, the, the gene is turned on or the gene is turned off. So, review lang natin yung ating uh, basic biology, di ba? yung ating central dogma of molecular biology. The many enzymes and proteins that we have in our bodies are the products of the transcription and the translation of the genes that we have in our in the nucleus of our cells. So the reason why our liver is able to, to perform the many activities that it does is because of the genes that are turned on to produce the many enzymes that are found in our liver. The reason why our muscles are able to contract is because of the, the formation of the muscle proteins that are found in our muscle tissues. So conversely, the muscle tissue doesn't perform the liver uh, activities because many of the liver enzymes are not turned on in our muscle tissues. They were not uh, expressed. And in the same way, our liver tissues do not perform uh, muscle activities because many of the enzymes or many of the structural proteins that are found in our muscles are not expressed in our liver. So merong na turn on sa liver na, na, na turn off sa muscles and vice versa. So ito yung um, gene regulation na, na minamention natin dito. And we tried to experiment on that in our, um, in our um, fungal isolates by um, using epi epigenetic inducers. So epi means outside of the, the mechanism of gene expression. So in this case, dito sa picture na ito, HDAC means uh, histone deacetylase. So histone, yung II inhibitor. So histone deacetylase inhibitor. So as an inhibitor, it inhibits the histone deacetylase. So what is the activity of the histone deacetylase? The histone deacetylase, as the term implies, it removes the acetyl groups that are found in our histones. So ito yung ating uh, DNA. Ito yung histones. Alam natin na our DNA is wound over our histone proteins. And itong, while acetylated, itong whole histones, while acetylated, the histone proteins are apart. So medyo magkakalayo sila. Pero kapag tinanggal natin yung acetylation, mas nagdidikit-dikit sila. So kung makita natin dito, if the chromatin is open because they are acetylated, they are transcriptionally permissive. So ang ibig sabihin nun, they, are, they, can non be, they can now be transcribed and then consequently translated. And uh, once translated, the, the proteins, whether structural or enzymes, can now be uh, formed kapag ganito, transcriptionally permissive, acetylated siya. Pero with the histone, de acet histone de acetylase, magko-condense yung ating uh, histones. So mas mahihirapan ngayon na makapasok yung mga transcription uh, enzymes natin para matranscribe. So they are, 
this is, this is turned on, this situation is turned off. Hindi siya, uh, uh, yeah. So they are trans, uh, at the straight of mentioned transcriptionally repressed. So ganyan. So sa, yung strategy namin dito ay we tried to inhibit the HDAX. So itong mga para the, the chromatin remains uh, transcriptionally permissive. And what did we use? So parang um, a certain, so based on literature naman ito lahat, so we used certain concentrations of uh, valproic acid, of uh, nicotinamide, separately of course, and uh, sodium butyrate. So these are common um, compounds naman. Actually, nung pinurchase namin sila, medyo mura naman sila. Hindi naman sila ganun ka, kamahal. And they are effective uh, histone deacetylase inhibitors that uh, retain the permissive uh, uh, state for the transcription factors to be able to access our DNA. So, uh, yung dating uh, nakaturn off, sinubukan namin i-on with the use of epigenetic inducers. Kagaya yung sinabi ko kanina, yung nicotinamide, yung um, valproic acid, at saka yung sodium butyrate. Okay, so so pero ano yung ano yung parang si Yuri namin doon, ano yung hypothesis namin? Because similar to our analogy earlier, yung liver at saka yung muscle cells, there are genes that are turned off currently and there are genes that are currently turned on. And um, usually those that are turned off are those that are uh, defined or described as cryptic or silent genes at that particular time. So for example, yung mga fungus na natin, yung mga fungus natin, um, dahil pinatubo natin sila di ba, sa culture media, very rich yung culture media, uh, nandun na yung pwede na lang kainin. Yung mga proteins, carbohydrate sources nila, they were all, and minerals, they are all provided in the medium. Ibig sabihin, they do not need to um, express any uh, gene that codes for a secondary metabolite. So, Kunyari, pag may competition or pag reduce environment, kailangan nilang patayin or kalabanin yung, yung competition nila at doon sila nagpo-produce ng, ng, ng uh, secondary metabolite. Pero dahil nga very rich yung ating video, these uh, uh, genes for secondary metabolites are turned off. So what we did, we exposed them to small epigenetic modifiers. It, um, nakalagay sa slide are those that we did not use. 5-acetylene uh, and subiroyl anilide hydroxamic acid. Uh, these are quite expensive, kaya hindi na namin siya ginamit. But what, what we try to do is to uh, inhibit in this particular case itong histone deacetylase para mag magawa yung natural product uh, o ma-express yung natural products by yung synthetic genes. So parang we tried uh, turning on this uh, silent or uh, uh, um, cryptic na mga secondary metabolite genes. And we were quite, we were quite successful because um, we found out uh, through uh, the many um, metabolites uh, sa downstream chemistry uh, applications, nakita namin na nag-increase yung bioactivity, especially in relation to um, in relation to uh, antibacterial uh, activity against escape. So nakita namin na kapag gumamit kami ng gumamit kami ng epigenetic inducers, mas tumaas yung percentage inhibition sa mga escape bacteria as compared to the treatments na hindi namin ginamitan ng epigenetic inducers. So uh, again, it, it is exciting, although uh, nasa preliminary stages pa lang kami, exciting because we may have induced the genes that produces some novel compounds. Sa, kung magbabasa tayo sa metabolomics doon sa turning on ng mga genes, doon dito tayo makaka-discover ng possibly novel ng mga, ng mga compounds. Especially in such organisms that are not really studied uh, as, as, um, as actively as that of, uh, of, of plants, for example. Okay. So, yun yung... So, the different um, um, experiments that were performed are in the hope of providing uh, additional activities or additional armaments, additional leads towards the, the production of uh, antibacterials. 
the production of um, um, resistance modifying uh, compounds um, for the uh, control of hypercholesterolemia, for the management of pain, for uh, the discovery of siderophores, for uh, Trojan horse uh, management and introduction of drug delivery. And, and all of this is, uh, is um, highlighted by the very rich um, genomes of fungi once we, we um, expose them to epigenetic um, induction. Okay, so moving forward, what are we doing to continue this uh, exciting researches? We are um, performing bioactivity guided fractionation. So we, uh, we have, nung nagsimula itong project na ito, nung 2015, we produced um, 350 crude extracts. So 350 crude extracts from 350 different isolates. So, hindi naman lahat yun siyempre ay bioactive. Pero uh, the volume of information is, is there. Kaya nandun yung, yung, yung passion, the, the, the interest to continue on. And because we have found bioactive uh, crude extracts, what we need to do is to fractionate them and to check the different um, activities of these fractions using a flash chromatography system, which is much faster than a semi-preparative uh, semi uh, HPLC because the columns are quite bigger. It can accommodate more of the crude extracts and of course the, the flow through is much faster, although the, the pressure is uh, the resolution is lesser as compared to um, the LC times, the uh, uh, semi-preparative semi and even in that, obviously, the analytical uh, CROM. And of course, guided by and helped by this uh, very useful uh, equipment here, the solvent uh, evaporation system. Kasi nga, matagal talagang mag, mag, uh, mag dry. Doon sa night, as per experience nga natin, yung, yung nitrogen, yung nag-blow tayo ng nitrogen doon sa fraction, yung 10 ml niya ay sabihin mo ng 30 minutes. Dito, yung uh, 30 ml niya ay mag-reduce into half or even one-third of the time. So, Napapabilis siya ng gusto. So, bio bioactivity guided fractionation are the succeeding steps. And then, in order to follow the drug discovery track, nakita natin kanina yung drug discovery track, um, uh, kailangan nating ma-separate yung mga peaks and try to uh, try to discover what these peaks are, these individual peaks are. So kailangan natin ng um, uh, mass uh, spectrometry uh, no, with tandem with uh, uh, liquid chromatography. So para ma-isolate ma natin at ma-purify natin yung mga compounds. And of course, once you have identified, uh, once you have separated the compounds, what we need to do is to know what these compounds are, or at least to through um, sequence of uh, well, um, database homology. So you, you, through the global natural products social networking system. So pwede na, pwede yung research ito. Global natural products social networking system, yun yung platform na ginagamit namin to um, facilitate or at least to discover kung ano ba yung information na nanggaling dito sa uh, LCMS uh, uh, facility. By the way, our collaborator for LCMS is the laboratory of Dr. Tias Cunio, oh, again, of the uh, Institute of Chem. We are also in close coordination with the laboratory of Dr. Uh, Drexel Camacho of the De La Salle University dito sa mga uh, downstream chemi chemistry applications, kasi obviously. Be, bilang biologists, hindi na namin ito rem. We have to, we have to defer, of, obviously, to the expertise of the experts para matulungan kami dito. But the goal of the replication is to identify uh, which these compounds, the possibly these, these compounds, kasi after fractionation, ipinapadala namin ito doon sa, doon sa um, LCMS facility, and then they give us back this, and then we subject them to the GN GNPS online uh, platform, chem 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 informatics platform, in order for us to what to know or to have an idea of what uh, compounds are present in our fractions. 
cells. And that is the process of their replication. Okay, so uh, learnings. So ito yung gusto kong i i i it's ipakita din sa inyo no? hopefully to inspire you also that um, fungi are especially itong mga endophytes at saka epiphytes are promising producers of low molecular weight compounds with various way activities sa dami ng mga na perform na namin na mga assays all of these are in vitro assays lang though so but they are promising because um, we, we find that there are several um, isolate several fractions, several crude extracts that exhibit these uh, bioactivities, and um, they make us excited about uh, the possibility of, of uh, contributing. Of course, the marami pang pwedeng daanan yan. Nakita naman natin dun sa ating uh, flowchart kanina na kailangan ng admitox, uh, toxicity testing, yung um, um, assimilation, um, Yung, yung admetox, yung ad, admet testing yung sa pharmacy na kasi ito. So, hindi rin ako masyadong familiar. Yung, yung parang sa physiology kapag ininom na natin kung paano natin siya ma, ma, mailabas ulit. Yung uh, structure, activity, relationship. Pwede bang i-tweak pa ito ng organic chemist para mas gumanda pa yung kanyang bioactivity, etc. Pero essentially, um, we, we have found out that this uh, fungi that we can easily isolate from our environment can be very uh, rich um, research, um, uh, focus of our researches, basic researches. And aside from that, on the taxonomy side, uh, there are more to be discovered. So, ang inaral lang natin kanina, uh, yung, yung pinakita ko na halaman sa inyo, isang bryophyte, dalawang ferns, uh, dalawang dicots, at dalawang monocots. At lahat yun ay high elevation uh, relatively high elevation plants sa Cordillera lahat ng nanggaling. Kung nandyan kayo sa Bicol, kung nandyan kayo sa Central Luzon, uh, kung meron malapit sa inyo na dagat, uh, you can all, you can get um, fragments or pieces of any plant or any animal that you are interested to investigate and isolate um, uh, fungi from them and then perform the same or other um, assays uh, using the good extra extract of all of these fungi. So, doon pa lang sa perspective na yun, parang bumubulaga sa atin na ang daming pwedeng gawin, ang daming natin pwedeng uh, ma-discover dito sa mga fungus na ito. Kagaya doon sa sinabi din ni Dr. Jason kanina, uh, kapag na-discover natin yung mga interactions ng ating microbiome sa ating health, mas nagiging exciting yung ating uh, pagtingin doon sa field of research na yan. And, and third, but Definitely not the least that collaboration is key in research. My background as a biologist, I can only um, I can only do as much. I can I can isolate the fungus from uh, from the many substrata that I think I can isolate fungus. I can um, uh, identify this fungi to that uh, appropriate level that this that that is allowed by the data that is available. I can um, perform the assays and interpret the results, but the downstream um, bioactive, the downstream chemistry applications is not is already outside of my comfort zone. It's already outside of my expertise. So that is why my collaboration with um, uh, the university's collaboration with the Institute of Chemistry, with uh, of the Pidiniman, with um, uh, De La Salle University. All of these have greatly contributed to the, the how productive the, the laboratory is because uh, we have to admit sometimes that we can we can only do so much and the many other things that uh, we should be doing is should be done by all the others that are better than us in those fields. So yun lang yung kailangan natin yung recognize that well we can only do so much and there is value and there is um, uh, there is. Um, uh, logic behind uh, the tapping of uh, the expertise of others because in that particular uh, ecosystem or in that particular ritualistic relationship, mas nagiging productive yung research natin at nakikinabang tayo, nakikinabang sila and in general nakikinabang yung, yung scientific field. 
and of course um, one of these things are are not possible if the funding of course is not present kagaya ng sinabi ni, ni Sir kanina ni Sir Jason medyo expensive yung mga gamit pero one way to go around this is to collaborate because the equipment may be present in other uh, universities and um in be uh, no, 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 be not uh, sensitive enough to get critiques of our proposal and be strong enough to forward our proposals kung wala dito lang naman tayo natututo di ba when we subject ourselves to um to constructive criticism that is when we improve our craft and actually yung yung mga research research proposals ko that were funded by the OST are just a few of the many proposals that I submitted. So kailangan lang ng lakas ng loob na gawin mo ng maayos yung proposal and you submit it for uh, funding. Ang natutunan ko naman dito sa process na ito ay uh, very supportive naman itong mga funding agencies natin. If they find your proposal meritorious, they will help you improve your proposals. Pero siyempre kailangan ng, ng inherent na na input. So, kailangan may input, may initial ka na na templates, and then, etc. And then, they will help you out to, to so that later on, they will provide you the funding. Okay, so I hope uh, with the, the lectures that I, this this particular lecture, you have, uh, I, I was able to uh, provide you primarily, sana, yung, yung inspiration to do these many things. Um, I was in the same boat as you are when I, I was starting. I was a relatively unknown, obviously. I was a junior faculty also, but I went through um, the, the each rung of the of the ladder. Uh, and I, I'm not saying that I am already uh, na successful. Na marayo pa kung dadaan, marayo pa kung bigas na kakainin to. But I am happy. I'm, I am uh, where I am at. But uh, and I give uh, my gratitude to everyone who have uh, influence and. In who have uh, uh, helped me out, but uh, the many merits I, that I am um, enjoying now is because of this, the third, the collaboration. Uh, we, ha we have to really be willing to work with others. And with that, uh, thank you very much, uh, Meiji. You can facilitate the question and answer. Thank you. Ayun, thank you, so, thank you so much, Paul, again, Sir Don, for that very insightful and very um, encouraging, humbling sharing sa inyong uh, concluding statement. Ayan. Um, also, thank you, sir, for introducing to us. So while waiting for the questions, we do highly encourage our participants to um, fill in their questions sa ating chat box po. You may send it to... Um, everyone, and then babasahin ko po yung questions niyo to our viewers in our YouTube channel as well. We do highly encourage you to post your questions sa ating comment section, and then our technical team would uh, field or would pass on the questions to us para po ma-address din natin sila. Ayan, uh, as of now, sir, and dami pong nagtitink you sa inyo for that very um, insightful and very... Uh, Parang sobrang feeling ko yung knowledge gain namin ngayon sa, dun sa field, sir, is as in umangat po talaga siya. Thank you, sir, Don, as everyone is chatting. Ayan, sir. And um, dun sa habang hinihintay natin yung mga tanong nila, I would also just like to um, mention how I have appreciated yung... Um, how I have appreciated yung uh, ating mga isolates na present ni Sir kanina in relation to human health. It is also very amazing that in our very own laboratories and I think then sa laboratories ng ating mga participants in their own institutions, they would also be able to see how amazing um, such how we can replicate or how we can somehow observe yung functions ng mga drugs using the isolates that they have uh, uh, taken from uh from the organisms na nasa paligid nila. And sobrang amazing din po nung Trojan force, nung yung sa drug mechanism uh, Trojan force po. Ayan. So sa, um, sure some of our participants and listeners who are um, interested in such field of research also gain much insight for their future researches. Uh, researches. And also, as you mentioned, sir, I think most of us are in, are interested to contribute as well dun sa line of work, yung sa may cholesterol, uh, yung sa chem part po nun. Especially nga na, I think 
hin, uh, in most of our families, meron ata tayo parang at least isang member na may problema na <laughs> may problema or yeah <laughs> sa amin din sir ayan so hopefully hindi maipasa yung genes ayan sa aming mga bata okay so related to this um fields of uh work to this uh, research line there is a question from an anonymous attendee who i guess is one of the aspiring researchers so ito po yung question niya sir if you don't mind me asking bilang marami pa sa amin ang hinahanap ang lugar sa research community, ano po yung situation or event that sparked your interest in this field to pursue it kahit wala, na, kahit wala man kaming major in that certain topic. So, ayun po. Um, sa tingin ko, uh, we can, si, siyempre yung unang sagot siguro dyan yung, yung um, curriculum na pinagdaanan. Makikita nyo kasi yun eh, kung alin yung mga subjects na in-enjoy ninyo. Like, uh, yung hindi, nyo, hindi kayo kailangang kumbinsihin na pumasok sa klase. Yung araw-arawin, maski masungit yung teacher, yun, actually yung pinaka-test na yun eh, na maski hindi mo gusto yung style ng teacher, pero pasok ka ng pasok because the content interests you. Yun yung best na measure na, na gusto mo yung field. Hindi ka pumapasok dahil dun sa teacher, pero pumapasok ka dahil dun sa field. So yun. Um, kung kasi nasabi doon na hindi niya major, so ibig sabihin baka wala sa mga sec, mga mga subjects na nakuha niya sa curriculum niya um, pwede yun makita siguro sa well immediately doon sa YouTube videos mo na sinasuggest o kaya yung mga Facebook pages na sinasuggest sa'yo uh, sa mga sa mga scientific na mga possibly ng no, Facebook groups or YouTube videos, doon mo makikita. Like for example, uh, common na uh, pinapunod mo is about plants or about agriculture. So, kasi yun yung parang sa lahat na pinakita sa'yo ng YouTube, sa AI ng YouTube at sa AI ng, ng Facebook. At ang lagi mong kiniklik ay ito. Ipapakita niya naman yun, yung unang-unang mong makikita na video or makikita mo pa ulit-ulit na suggested ng, ng Facebook. Ibig sabihin, yun yung frequent mong kiniklik. So, baka yun yung interest mo. So, you can start, so, pwede kang mag-build upon that. So, for example nga, kung, kung microbes yung usually na, na nag enjoy ka sa TED Talks or sa, sa kung ano mang mga videos, ibig sabihin, pwede ka nang ngayong mag-graduate sa pagbabasa ng pwede namang, pwede, pwede namang sa uh, layman's, layman article lang, yung mga nature type, yung mga nature articles kasi usually mga sa nature articles mas hindi masyadong technical yung mga yan eh mas dahil ang readership ng ng nature ay mga uh, general readers parang ganun. and then once you have appreciated yung mga articles na ganyan you can go to more specific articles or more specific more specific journals so if you are looking at uh, fungus for example edi eh, maghanap ka ng fungus um Free to read, of course. Free to read uh, online journals about the fungi. Mga ganun. Uh, or sa mga plants or sa agriculture. So, yun, yung mga small things na na hindi mo mga masyadong pinag-iisipan, typically, it, it, it provides you a good idea of where your interests are, actually. And yun din, yung, yung crowd mo din, like kung yung mga barkada mo or many of your friends are microbiologists, they most probably mga sa informal gatherings nyo ay mayroong mga nerd type of conversations na mga microbiome pinag-uusapan but you enjoy it. So, nakikinig ka. So, ibig sabihin nyo are a micro person. Or kung yung mga again, pag nag-uusap naman about about plants tapos in-enjoy mo din. Di ba ka plant person ka? So, take cues from those small uh, um, activities uh, for you to discover possibly what your interests are. Ayun, thank you very much, sir. As in, sobrang napa-flashback din ako noon. Tapos parang, oh, I agree in a lot of points, sir. I agree in a lot of points. Parang how I landed into this specialization. Parang yun din, yung sinasabi din ni sir kanina. And yun nga, parang, uh, minsan it's just around you. Eh. You just yeah. have to recognize it. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. I think nasagot natin yung tanong ng ating attendee. Um, here is um, another question po from um, from Miss Ethel Ruth Bakiran of uh, the University of the Philippines, Baguio. 
Hello, sir. Thank you, Paul, for being one of those people who ignited our interest in research and in plant physiology. Bilang prof ko po kayo in college and sa masters. I have known you po as someone who easily adapts to changes and can represent solutions fluidity in every situation. I agree. I would like to ask po for any tips on how we can adapt this forward-looking attitude in our research topic and career as bilang may tendency po tayo mag-focus sa problema. Sabi sa inyo, mentor talaga namin si Sir. Eh. Uh, talk to people. Yun sa tingin ko yan. So, sometimes kasi we tend to overthink when we are by ourselves. Yun yung sa tingin ko na malaking uh, pagtulong sa kapag we are thinking of the problems already. At usually, it's just the product of overthinking. Parang we highlight the, diffic- the now that is difficult, the now that is problematic. But when we try to parang get a hold of ourselves lang by talking to others and talking to those, uh, well, if I can drop names, talking to Sir Rom and <laughs> talking to, to Sir Ronnie and to the, our participants here, you, you, can, you can see naman eh. You can see people, you can... You have in your circle of friends those who are easy to talk to in any particular topic, and that gets you out of the the spiraling uh, funnel of uh, of depression or negative thinking. Sometimes we just have to get out of that 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 process of of thinking. And after that, kayo lang din tayo tayo din ang makakapag-isip na ah, ah wala pa hindi pala problema ito eh ganun. hindi pala siya malaking problema. In the grand scheme of things, I um kurot lang pala yung kagat ng langgam lang pala. All right, thank you sir. Thank you so much sir for um again inspiring us and reminding us I'm of not a psychologist po. I mean, Pero parang talking. therapist po namin si sir. <laughs> Ayun, thank you very much po again from a lot of our participants all over us from the different institutions. Ayun, thank you sir. Thank you sir from all of our participants. Ayun. Uh, what a wow, sabi ni Sir uh, ni Ma'am uh, Marita Sanchez. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much, Sir. Sabi niya po. Congrats and thank you po. Ayan. So, may mga pahabol pa po ba? Ayan, from Ma'am Karen Baliada. Um, thank you, Sir, for your honest and uplifting answers. Yon, yun yung term uplifting answers. Thank you for that, Ma'am Karen. Alright, so kung wala na po tayong mga magpapahabol pa na tanong, kaya uh, na, na rin daw po sa ating uh, YouTube channel. So kung wala na pong magpapahabol ng ating mga tanong, I think uh, nag, ah, there's ito. May, may isang nagpahabol. So let me just read this one from um, Ma'am or Sir JT. Good morning po, Prof. Um, Dr. Hipol. Some or many researchers and also students are deterred or maybe deterred to venture into drug discovery and drug development as their career path due to the laborious experiments, expensive experiments, and the longer time to be devoted. Halimbawa po, sir, sa dami po nang, nang, nang naumpisahan po ninyo for the search for potential bioactive but you are also referring that there is still uh, more things to be done and still more time is needed. Um, your thoughts, po, sir, um, on this prejudices about drug discovery research as a career path? Uh, siguro maswerte lang din kasi ako personally, I find myself uh, blessed and lucky to be able to get Uh, to be able to stand on uh, the shoulders of giants. Um, they would not, the, the funding agency would not know me if uh, I wasn't collaborating with the people in Diliman. This is a, a reality that we really, have to, we really have to face. So, which means that um, if we, we can always, uh, it's a good privilege na rin that I am in the academy with the support system available already. So it is also real that uh, the limitations of the many of our budding and young scientists is that the system is system existing in their uh, universities or schools are not really permissive, silent, no silences. They are not really permissive in the conduct of such researches. However, it doesn't preclude many of us to collaborate. I mean, our, our individual limitations 
will be solved by another's um, um, uh, 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 available available opportunities. So yun yun yung gusto kong pakita dito na uh, sometimes um, you can sabi ko parang irelate ko lang yung sinabi natin kanina na ma- ma-highlight kasi yung kakulangan natin kapag umaasa lang tayo sa sarili natin. Mas ma-highlight yung opportunities if you work with others. Kasi um, uh, ma- 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 hindi man lahat hindi man lahat ay ma-address natin yung iba natin needs. And we can always start simple. We can always start simple. Uh, I started out in uh, the diversity lang ng pungus. Yun yung pinakamasimulang simula ko. Nag-isolate lang talaga ako ng pungus. Yun lang. And then, nung na-isolate ko yung pungus, tapos, uh, by, parang biodiversity study siya, kasi yun naman yung scene natin. Yun, biodiversity siya. Tapos, naisipan ko lang na mag-extend sa isang bioactivity, antibacterial. So, so hinay-hinay. Parang ganun, hinay-hinay. At through the... Nagsimula po ako nito 2015. So, meron na akong seven years na ginagawa dito. So, yung iba siguro sa inyo, you have the, you have the opportunity to stay long in your universities, but others hindi nga ganun kahahaba yung, yung, yung timetable ninyo. Diba? So, kunyari, parang thesis lang ganyan. So, yun lang yung, yung habol, yun, yun yung habol ninyo. So, you can target specific, simple questions, simple research questions that you can do on your own, or you can do with uh, very few collaborators or a few collaborators. Para kasi ang problema naman pag ang dami-dami mong collaborator, ang hirap din ng ang hirap din ng one uh, uh, pag-establish ng talking points. Parang sabi nga nila, hindi na masarap yung sopas pag maraming cook. Pag ang dami nang naglalagay ng kung ano-anong herbs. Ganyan. So pag masyadong complex na yung problem, hindi na rin siya masaya. So, Um, you can start small. You can start um, with uh, the available collaborators that you have in your region. So I think, I think, basta you start, yun lang, yun lang naman yun. The first step is the key. And collab- sabi nito, collaborations. Ayan. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for that uh, very humble answer. And yun nga, uh, to, the key is to start. Ayan. Mayroon din po nagsabi sa atin sa... Um, chat that collaboration is the key from Ma'am Maika. Ayan. Very inspiring po sabi ng ating mga participants. Um, that also siguro we can have this as our last question from Sir Jethro Arthur uh, Cladera. Okay. Thank you for the very insightful talk, Sir. Uh, do you have advice for fellow advisors on how to better connect and mentor their mentees? Thank you po. And here is a uh, parang pasunod na question. What is your advice um, ayun. What is your advice for research students regarding how to choose the best mentor for their research goals? Yeah, especially sa mga siguro senior science high school si sir. Ayan. Yung, yung first question, yung uh, how to better connect and mentor their mentees? Uh, depende kasi yung talaga sa student. Uh, walang no size fits all kung baga. So meron yung mga mentees na they thrive better if they are left alone. You talk to them once a month. Bas- and, and they are, kung baga, the motivation is with them. They do not need to be motivated because they want what they're doing. Meron namang mentees na talagang kailangan mo siya ng kausapin halos araw-araw kasi sila mismo yung mga mentees ay uh, siguro may distracted mga ganun. So I, I think uh, but of course yung kayo yung kayo na tayo na mentors we can in the same way we can only do so much. I mean ako as a person uh, uh, hindi din ako masyadong ano na yun, araw-araw makipag-usap sa aking mga advisors advices kasi Being an introvert, I get really tired with, with uh, talking to people. I mean, um, you have we have to take care of ourselves also. Parang ganun. To be effective mentors, we have to take care of ourselves also. So in the same way that we adjust to our mentees, the mentees should adjust to us also. So it's a two-way thing. Okay? Yung next I how to choose the best mentor. Uh, yung, siguro yung field, yung field of expertise is there. Um, if you think you like this particular field and if the best person is uh, 
you don't like the personality of the best person. But the, at the end of the day, what you want is a very good output. Diba? Say, parang, uh, siyempre gusto mo enjoyable din, pero gusto, mas, mas mataas yung good output. Eh. And it's your choice to enjoy it or not enjoy it. So, uh, just uh, focus, say, I think focus primarily your fit of expertise if you choose, if you are asked to choose the best mentor. Ayun, thank you, thank you so much, sir, for accommodating the, the questions. Ayun po, ayan. So, um, siguro, I think this is more of, siguro, last na to, sir. Sir, are you accepting research, assistantship, or mentorship for students po? Okay. Uh, noong yung pre-pandemic, noong pre-pandemic, open yung lab namin for, we had um, formal agreements with design. So we took on interns, student interns uh, from PISAI. We also take in um, regular students, college students, na um, parang short lang, parang pag may kailangan lang silang mga activities, ganyan. Uh, pero by the next year kasi, uh, I'm scheduled to go on sabbatical, so baka not in the near future siguro. But... Uh, Uh, there are others naman dito sa university. There are other professors who are willing to take on student NP. So siguro formal agreements na lang between your institution with UP Pablo. I think eh, masisettle natin naman natin yun ang maalis. Yes, sir. Ayan. So yun po. And hopefully makapag-face-to-face na nga rin tayo para mas ma-enjoy po natin yung mentorship at yung collaboration. So For students, uh, pati yung mga ibang DOST scholars, uh, I think they are required sa program nila to have parang one-year um, internship, parang ganun ata yung tawag nila, or mentorship under, ano, um, we can coordinate din naman po yun. Ayun po. So again, thank you, thank you so much for all of those who fielded their questions. Ayan. And thank you also, sir, for um, accommodating, for generously accommodating and um, answering those questions po. And Mukhang gutom na rin po yung ating mga kasamahan. So sige, let us proceed po with our program. So to thank our speaker for his very insightful um, sharing and selection niyo po ngayong umaga, um, can, uh, we will award the certificate to Dr. Roland Hipol. So uh, may I please ask? Ayan, ayan po. So... Um, let me just read the citation of our certificate. This certificate of appreciation is presented to Professor Roland Hippol for serving as a resources speaker for the talk entitled Fungal Bioresources, Promising Bioactivities of Fungi for Human Health during the Virtual 27 Summer Institute in the Natural Sciences and Mathematics with the theme Upgrading Senior High School Science and Mathematics Education Content and Competency Part 2, and with the Department Biology sub-theme, Rekindling Appreciation of Biodiversity from Classroom to Community, uh, signed by the Chair of the CINESM, Prof. Meiji T. Bagangao, and of course, the Dean of the College of Science, our Professor Dimna and Javier. Ayan. Maraming maraming salamat again, sir, for sharing to us yung ginagawa niyo po sa research ninyo ngayon and all of this very um, interesting po na topics sa when it comes to um, epigenetics, to bio, uh, to metabolomics. Ayan. For sure, marami sa ating mga participants po yung na-inspire. Ayan. So, to our dear participants, okay lang po ba sa inyo na mag-try tayo mag-on ng camera natin para po makapag-photo ops tayo with our speakers and also the technical team of the CINESM. Wait lang po ah, i-on ko lang po yung function para makapag-on tayo ng camera. Wait lang po sa ating mga participants. Okay. Ayun. Okay, let us uh, maybe request everyone to uh, turn on their cameras for our photo ops po. Ayan. I think we can turn on na our photos. Our... Ayan. Since this is also the last day, ayan, thank you so much po. I can see yung mga cameras na po ninyo na naka-turn on. Alright. Since this is also the last day of our CINESM, 
and for the biology cluster and also for the entire College of Science. So kung umaten po kayo ng previous weeks sa ating um, sa human genetics program, sa physical sciences, at saka sa mathematics and computer science po, this is our concluding day. Okay, so para naman po madocument natin yung ating bonding ng mga nakaraang tatlong araw at nung nakaraang buwan nung nakasama po kayo sa ibang departments, um, let us have this photo ops po. Okay, so I will be starting to take um, screenshots na po sa unang page po muna siguro tayo. Alright, meron tayong anim na yon, So please bear with me and um, keep your smiley faces po. Okay, so first is lot. Ayan. Tapos dun po tayo sa second. Smile lang po tayo. Dun po tayo sa third. Ayan, ang dami-dami po kasi natin. Sa fourth. Ayan po, wait lang po. And then sa fifth. Come on. And okay, last na po. Ayan, thank you so much again everyone for attending our um, and for listening to the lectures natin this morning. Maraming maraming salamat po. Ayan. So before we um, as uh, thank you also to Sir Don sa kanyang talk and also for us to improve yung mga future lectures at saka mga future na aming mga pa-webinar and pa-workshop, may we please ask everyone to our dearest participants to fill our evaluation form with the link posted in the chat box of our Zoom webinar or in the comment section also of our YouTube. For those, since pandemic na rin po, marami na tayong scanner application sa ating phones. Ayan, I think you can also scan yung um, barcode na na-share screen kanina nung ating, ayan, na naka-share screen ngayon, alright, na naka-share screen ngayon, you can scan the barcode and that would lead you to the evaluation link for the talk of Dr. Roland Hipol. Again, we thank you so much, Dr. Roland, and for that very, um, very insightful and very informative talk po. Okay, so... Ayan, congratulations po and thank you. Thank you then very much to all of our participants. Again, the evaluation link is posted in our Zoom chat box and also in the comment section of the YouTube channel. You can also scan the barcode na naka-share screen po sa ating Zoom. Okay, and that will lead you to the to the site of the evaluation link. Maraming maraming salamat po. Okay. So that has already been three days, okay? And we hope you have learned a lot from our speakers and resource persons in this lecture series and workshop, not only to the biology cluster, uh, but as well if you have attended the previous lectures ng mga nakaraang cluster din po. Your participation in our three-day lecture series and workshop means a lot to us. And we hope whatever knowledge and skills that you have and how, uh, that you have have been enriched in the past three days as we have conducted this um, biology cluster 27 Sinesa. And because we are really short of time, a lot of, I know a lot of us are also hungry. Let us close the biology cluster 27 Sinesam with a heartwarming closing remarks from our very caring department chair and also a recognized diplomat of the Philippine Association of Microbiologists. And so, Doc Ronnie, I give the spotlight to you now. Sir, nakamute pa po ata. Ayan. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Ayan. Maraming maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. Um, magandang umaga sa inyo. At uh, unang-una, gusto ko pong pasalamatan ang mga taong nasa behind the scenes, uh, yung mga aside from the moderators and the MCs, uh, our untiring and very dedicated uh, people in the Department of Biology, si Ms. Ethel Bakiran, si Stephanie uh, Tirao, si Jamie Daus, si Ma'am Kimberly Paglingayen, si Kautar Sharif, si Maika Dispo, Jodeline Melegrito, at ang aming staff ng CS, si Jessan at si Mark, may nakalimutan ba ako? Si Patrick Penales. 
Opo. Um, ituro po uh, pang ilang beses na po nilang nagmaman ng mga national symposium katulad nito. So maraming maraming salamat sa kanila. And of course, yung uh, head ng Department of Biology ng Sinism Committee, si Ms. Allen G. Mark, Mark Allen G. Marquez. Maraming salamat. And of course, ang head, ng overall head ng CS Uh, sinism. Walang iba kundi si Ma'am Meiji Bagangaw. Yes! <laughs> Natapos na rin Meiji. Right after my talk, pwede ka nang ano, magpamasyad. Bigyan ng jacket yan. <laughs> And of course, uh, I would like uh, our gratitude to our uh, speakers, si Professor Roland Hipol, of course. Si Professor Meiji rin, nag-talk siya. Si Professor Sinayda Bawanan, Professor Lisel Magtoto, Professor Romeo Dison, and Professor uh, Aris Reginaldo. Um, ma maswerte po tayo at maswerte kayo at uh, napaunlakan nila, nagpaunlak po silang uh, magsalita during this cynicism. Uh, I can brag na this, this, your speakers are Uh, some of the most prolific in the field of biodiversity. At noong bago po pa lang ako sa UP Baguio, yun po kaagad, uh, honestly, ang tumatak sa akin. Wow! They really go to the field. They really bring their students. Uh, actual po talaga. Kaya uh, angkop na angkop po ang ating team ngayon, rekindling uh, appreciation of biodiversity from classroom to community because as we are preparing for uh, the face-to-face -face, uh, gradual and blended mode of learning, uh, nagkaroon po tayo ng ganitong tema para when you go back to your classrooms, uh, to your students, I really hope that uh, we have done our part uh, impacting you and you infusing the knowledge into your students and uh, some of the participants are, are our students. I hope ka, ka microbiology track ka, bio, biology track or uh, ecology and systematics, you have um, assimilated uh, from the speakers from this event. Okay. And of course, uh, lastly, I would like to think, thank each and every one of you po na dumalo Uh, dito sa ating sinisom ng bio and um, ang gusto ko lang pong sabihin pa ulit-ulit ko pong sinasabi ito but I will not tire of saying this to all my students you you are we are so lucky to be biologists in this beautiful country the Philippines because we are the center of the center of biodiversity the sad thing is uh, kulang po ang mga tao na experts dyan, kulang ang mga estudyante, kulang ang mga scientifico, at nauna pa po ang mga banyaga na nag-aaral ng ating biodiversity sa Pilipinas. So, um, so ngayong summer is coming, uh, when you tour, uh, I know as a biologist, you have a different eyes looking at all these beautiful resources of our, our country. So I hope uh, nagawa po ng Department of Biology na, na maliwanagan kayo, ma-inspire kayo na protektahan ang ating biodiversity at um, bilang uh, isa sa mga major na development sa Department of Biology, we have the MS Care program with, which is the conservation and restoration ecology. So ilang ang ilan po sa inyo are are teachers, some are students who are who would like to go into a graduate school to retool you or uh, tool you or uh, mahasa po kayo at maintindihan pa ng mas malalim ang ang biodiversity um, we invite you to enroll into our uh, graduate school the MS Care Conservation and Restoration Ecology we offer a uh, TA ship teaching assistant you can have a monthly salary of about 28,000 a month uh, free tuition uh, you you enroll six units and at the same time you teach six units we also offer full time uh, for for full time students we have slots for the OST scholarship. So uh, just email our uh, graduate program coordinators or Dr. Romeo Dizon, that's rmdizon at up.edu.ph or email me rjkalugay at 
up.up.edu.ph or you may email the secretariat. So, uh, yun lang po. Maraming maraming salamat po and I hope uh, you will go home uh, with a happy heart na meron na kayong alam. You will go home inspired uh, at at um, we are at the turning point of our history at uh, bilang biologists and um, and uh, environmentalists meron po tayong mahalagang impact okay so i hope nagampanan po namin yon to spark uh, to the to ignite the spark in you and uh, maging ano na yan domino effect so 2 minutes na lang po maraming maraming salamat uh, again sa mga participants sa inyong lahat, bawat isa sa inyo, ang mga speakers, ang mga faculty, ang dean ng uh, College of Science at ang College Executive Board. At of course, sa mga staff dito sa biology na for many months nagtrabaho. Meiji, Allen, thank you again. Alin na kayo, mga staff, and say thank you to everyone. Yay! <laughs> Bye. Thank you po. Maraming salamat. Ingat po. God bless you all. Bye. Maraming maraming salamat ulit sir for the heartwarming and inspiring and presenting opportunity sa ating mga participants. This has been your 27th Sinism. See you next year po sa ating 28th Sinism. In behalf of the committee, all the tech team speakers, your 27th Sinism is now signing off. We will be closing the webinar in five minutes. Yay! Thank you again. Galing na! Woo! Oh.